Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to the City Council Workshop, April 13th, 2020. Um, we're going to start off today with City Manager, Peter Creighton, and Fire EMS budget line item. So, Mr. Manager, take it from here, please. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I hope everybody's doing well and your families are doing well. Uh, thank you for your continued support. Tonight, we have a presentation from the Fire Chief, uh, Bob Chase, on Fire and EMS. Then our Finance Director, Jill Eastman, will speak about fringe benefits. And Holly Olivier will present Health and Human Services, Chris Muma, Human Resources, Paul Frazier, IT, and then Intergovernmental, we will be hearing from uh, three agencies. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, 911, uh, the LATC, and uh, I expect that uh, the presentations that we have are going to be important. The airport is the other uh, presentation that we'll have under intergovernmental, and then the mayor and council's budget. Thank you very much. Chief Chase. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Uh, Mayor and Council, thank you. Um, some brief slides, uh, as everyone else has done, and then we will certainly entertain some questions. Uh, and this is just intended to give you a summary overview of the, of the budget changes for Fire and EMS. Um, the primary operating budget, um, the express of the changes, if you will, from uh, FY20 to FY21, there's a total of 2.9% uh, increase. Um, over the current operating budget. Um, on the revenues side for the fire department, our primary revenue generator is on the EMS side. Um, we uh, had a $1,083,000 in actual revenue last year. Uh, the budget this year for EMS revenue is $1.2 million. Um, we have a, a few other line items that are, account to a little over $1,000 of other revenue sources. Those are permit fees and the like. Well, again, this is just a summary. Um, we have, we do expect the revenue numbers uh, in the next couple of fiscal years to increase incrementally. Um, that's primarily driven in part by the fact that main care has changed uh, the rate at which they reimburse us for main care EMS transports to, to more closely match the Medicare reimbursement rate. Um, and therefore we do think that the, the revenue will go up um, in the coming fiscal years. With regard to the expense drivers, um, most of the budget, as with most departments, the primary driver is salaries. Uh, and I broke the salaries down into two major components, regular uh, regular salaries, if you will, and then all of the overtimes groups together. Our regular salaries line is up 6%. Uh, the over, all of those overtime lines summed together is up 3.68% for a total uh, over uh, for a total payroll increase of 5.4. I need to add a little bit of context here to the 6% in salaries. Um, that is 6% increase over the current budgeted payroll. Um, one thing is that from FY19 to FY20, we did not budget a payroll increase. And at that time we were in, still in negotiations during the process. So we chose not to add any increase COLA to the FY20 budget. So therefore, 2% of the 6% you're seeing this year is really uh, something that was negotiated but wasn't included in the current fiscal year's budget. Um, moving forward into this current year, um, the negotiated contract with the firefighters included a 2% cost of living adjustment. And then what we did, uh, as you'll remember when we did the contract negotiations and the discussions, um, there's a cost offset, if you will, that previously uh, in FY18 and FY19, the uh, fire department didn't get any cost of living in their wage. What they got was a 2% contribution into a retirement health savings plan. And moving forward, um, administration would like to get those costs out of the retirement health savings plan and into the salary line. Um, when we, that, that was one of the things that came to light when we did the salary uh, comparison from city to city. Um, so having that all show in one line certainly is more depictive of, of what our salaries are in comparison to other areas. 
So 2% of that 6%, again, is that there's an offsetting savings in the retirement health savings plan line within the HR budget. Um, so it makes that salaries line look like a 6% increase. And really, it was 2% from the previous year, 2% this year, and then a 2% cost uh, reallocation from retirement health savings. Other budget drivers I summarized in this chart, um, primarily anything that moved up or down $1,000 or more, um, I kind of summarized here. I can give you some brief highlights. Our professional service general line, and, and a lot of this was taken uh, to un, under heavy scrutiny, knowing that we wanted to try to maintain as minimal increase on the whole budget as we could, and that we had quite, a, quite an increase showing on the payroll line. Professional services general last year, um, we had done a, a project increase of about $10,000 to do a rural water supply study and improve some dry hydrants. Um, that was a one-time project. We'll be finishing that work this spring, so there's no longer a need to keep that in the budget for, the, for next year. Um, other supplies include uh, a few things, but um, the, the, um, the increase there is primarily driven by two factors. We foresee a slight increase in the cost of our EMS supplies and also um, there's uh, some heavy um, fear about our the the foams that are used in firefighting, and I anticipate having to buy a small supply to get it start to stock up on uh, more environmentally friendly uh, Class B firefighting foam. Uh, motor vehicle supplies, electricity, and diesel um, are incrementally down, basically uh, in many cases driven by um, some known needs: the diesel and electric, based on consumption and hopefully some better rates that we'll be getting. Uh, vehicle repairs incrementally up uh, slightly. Um, though all of those numbers are really still less than we're currently spending. We're trying to maintain downward pressure on that budget line while keeping things serviceable and on the road, but putting good policies in to try to drive down vehicle repair costs. Training and tuition is down $61,000. If you remember last year in the budget presentation, that was really heavily driven last year as a big increase because it's very unlikely um, but it happened last year that we had to put five new hires through paramedic school within the fiscal year. We don't foresee having to do that again. Um, we do have some new hires coming on this year, so we did maintain a little bit of that line um, for that. But again, we were able to take, uh, I believe, at least three uh, training opportunities. Uh, we don't anticipate having to train three additional people to be paramedics this coming year. Um, other program costs for EMS are down slightly, though that's what we do to do additional uh, service level trainings. Um, communication equipment is up uh, $4,500. Uh, we have the need to upgrade our mobile display terminals. Those are our computer tablets and all of our um, rescues and engines. This is an incremental step to start to do those, and we won't do them all. Uh, they're about $2,400 each. Um, excuse me, about $2,200 each. Um, again, what that's for is it gives us call information. We're actually finding it to be hugely important in the midst of the COVID crisis we're at because we don't want always uh, patient medical information broadcast over the radio. And so we're able to get some specific call information pushed to us on our mobile display terminals. And then the SCBA cylinder line was eliminated this year. That was last year was the last of a five year program to upgrade our SCBA cylinders. Um, and so that $10,000 has been removed from the budget. Um, the last one is there are a series of other small incremental changes without the budget that went up or down a couple of hundred dollars, uh, to totaling a, a, an additional decrease in the budget of about twenty-two thirty-five. So all in all, uh, all of the budget line items uh, that weren't associated with payroll uh, are down seventy-three thousand uh, dollars, or uh, six point five percent for all of those items. Again, what that does is it gives us an operating budget. Um, increase total with all inclusive of, of fire and EMS expenses of uh, an increase of 2.9%. On the capital side, um, this is just a summary and I've got some details on those projects moving forward, but um, the first item there is the $100,000 request to allow for the purchase of the fire engine, which was approved $550,000 of which was approved last year. Again, I'd like to thank you for your consideration on that and passing of that. Uh, last week at your meeting, we're moving forward with the purchasing process on that, and that will be a great asset to the department. Um, new requests this year uh, include $50,000 for extrication equipment. Uh, that is 
Uh, it's, if you will, the jaws of life that we use for extricating people from vehicles and motor vehicle crashes, cutting them out of uh, heavily damaged vehicles. Um, we have a fire hose replacement. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we do have slated an ambulance replacement. Um, that money has been contributed regularly each year. Um, about $100,000 a year from EMS revenue is set aside for future EMS capital expenditures, which is a, a, a great um, plan and helps buffer those capital needs. Uh, that ambulance replacement, as we saw on the tour, um, in 2018, we replaced two of our ambulances, um, and we have yet to replace the third one that has been in service um, uh, that we were able to pick up quickly when we stood up EMS transport in 2014. Um, and I can get into some detail about the changes there. Uh, we additionally, through EMS Capital, are requesting a cardiac monitor. Um, and other items uh, not recommended by uh, the manager were a fire prevention vehicle and a uh, forestry unit and trailer for the replacement of our rescue one. Uh, just a quick slide, again, thank you for appropriating the additional $100,000 for the engine to replace engine three. Um, that will be uh, very Im impactful to the department. Extrication equipment, uh, as you see there, we talked about that's for removing people from vehicles. Um, the, the equipment continues to need to be upgraded um, and primarily driven by the new materials and high strength steels that are being put into motor vehicles these days. And old equipment just wasn't designed to be efficient and be able to cut apart those vehicles and get into them as we need to. So we're more frequently running into problems with extended extrications and difficulty entering and cutting apart these composite and high strength vehicle components. Um, so this is a, a, the first step to start to upgrade those. Uh, the other benefit of these this equipment is as you know, with most things that you deal with in your home, um, battery life has become incredible. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you know, your cordless drill battery didn't last very long. Well, now they have batteries that will run these tools. So we're no longer tethered, tethered to the, the hydraulic system on the truck, and it makes it much more functional for us to get down off of a road, for example, if a car goes into a tree, uh, and still be able to have our equipment reach. So that's the vehicle extrication request. Fire hose replacement. Um, this is $20,000. We have uh, several thousand feet of hose that has just over the last few years failed in testing. Um, and we're at the point now where, um, A, well, we won't be able to fully load a new apparatus if we were to receive it. And B, we like to have enough hose um, in reserve so that after a structure fire or whatever the case might be, while hose is cleaned and dried and stored, um, we can get a truck back in service. Um, so it's kind of a two need. Much of that's needed to, uh, to, to equip a new truck, and the other part would be to have enough spares to reload after a fire. Uh, as you see, this picture shows uh, confined space rescue, trench rescue, uh, high angle and rope rescue. Um, it's an old piece. Uh, we have maintenance issues with it, and we certainly can foresee that there will be continued maintenance issues. So. The alternative that I would propose um, would be to replace that ability to carry that equipment with a trailer, which is almost maintenance free, if you will, and then a pickup to haul that. Certainly understand, again, this wasn't brought forward uh, on the managers recommended, um, and we understand those constraints. We will continue to navigate using Rescue One um, and bring this forward in, in another year. Okay, Chief, that's it? I believe that is on your end. Last slide. Okay. Yep. Just uh, entertain any questions. Okay, folks. Any questions, the chief? Councilor Lasagna. Okay. Um, the question may be some kind of. Well, um, Chief Chase, thank you so much. When you came in, you said you were going to take a really hard look at the budget and you um, did, obviously, and I appreciate um, how it has been reduced. Um, one of the things is, in looking at it, the OSHA costs went up $1,500. What does that mean? Um, our OSHA costs are driven, there are a couple of things in there. One is uh, supplies for us to do fit testing for our SCBAs and our N95 masks and the equipment and supplies for that. But the other piece of that are our annual respiratory clearances, which is the 
um, medical component that allows us to wear those SCBAs. So the, if, you, if we look at our historicals, those costs have gone up a little bit uh, over the last couple of years in excess of the $10,000 budgeted. Um, part of that was driven by a conscious decision on our part. Um, for example, we have a, a TB test that needs to be administered. And what previously used to happen is they would do a plant in our arm, and then we'd have to have staff come back 24 hours later um, to get that read. Or some, I think it was actually 24 to 48 hours later um, to get that read. So for an incremental cost in this line item of, of about $10 per employee, we reduced an hour's overtime because we do a, a different test, a T-spot test, which is read automatically. Um, so that's part of where the, that increase comes in. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Dr. Carrier. Uh, Chief, I just had one quick question in regards to our reimbursement for the, uh, the ambulance crews. Uh, we collected a million, a little bit over a million dollars this year, and you're anticipating more. Are we upside down? Do we still have money outstanding uh, from this last year? Uh, are you talking about uh, revenue that we don't collect, our current collectibles? Right, yes. Um, I'm not sure that I have the information on what our current um, accounts payable, uh, excuse me, accounts receivable to us are on the financial side. Um, Jill might be able to help me get that and I can provide it to you. Okay, thank you very much. One thing Jill, I Jill will be speaking in a few moments. She can talk about that and, and the revenues that we have in there for this budget uh, are realistic revenues, we think, but Jill can speak about that. Council McLeod. Thank you, Chief. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll go really quickly. <clears throat> do you know roughly how much it costs to keep Rescue One on the road per year? Um, I do. Uh, in the last two budget seasons, we've spent just between the two, the current fiscal year and last fiscal year, just under $3,000 in repairs on it. Okay. So that's not including, is that a, a gas or diesel? That's a diesel. That's a diesel, okay. Yeah. Um, that's not including a fuel cost. That was just right, that's just straight repair yeah. cost. Do we yeah. know how much a trailer would cost without a pickup truck? I know that wasn't a recommended CIP item, but. $8,500. Do we have anything that can tow a trailer as is? Um, we do, it puts a strain on us to not have something that can tow that um, and be able to locate it, um, but that is a doable option. Okay. Do we yeah. look at getting a head gasket replaced on our fire uh, service? Fire uh, we have. We have. We, we would spend about fifteen hundred dollars to get the necessary repairs done that we have on on that unit. Do we know how long that would give us? Guesstimate. Um, I, I feel confident that doing the repairs that we need to on that, we would get at least another year or more out of that. Um, okay. Up front. <clears throat> and then the only last question I had, or two last questions. One. Uh, it shows that there's a gasoline ambulance. Is that the ambulance we're replacing? Yes. <clears throat> so then we can eliminate the gasoline ambulance line. If we get a diesel, a new diesel, once that comes in, that won't be in the budget anymore. Um, I'll have to look at how that's in the budget. We still have small vehicles, pickups, uh, the chief's vehicles, for example, that are still gas. So we will still have a gas line. Okay. Um, but it, but if it's specifically gas to the EMS budget, then yes, we would be able to eliminate the gas line for EMS. Okay. And the final question, are there any uh, grants that fire departments can tap into? At the there are. Level? Yeah, there are. We, we apply for a, a quite a series of grants. Um, we've had great success with grants for our fire prevention division, um, specifically for education, both funded by Walmart and some other local businesses. We've gotten uh, two grants in the last approximately four years from the community college system to do repairs to our uh, live fire training facility in the back of the building that you saw. Um, that was uh, $70,000 about four years ago and our current grant of about 24,000 that we're doing upgrades on now. And every year we apply for the AFG grants, Assistance of Firefighters grants. Um, that's a very competitive process through FEMA. Um, and we apply every year for, for those grants and um, Actually, we have a uh, pending application in now with them. Um, it's been a while since we received an AFG grant. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. One thing that I, I'd like to mention as well uh, with regard to the capital requests, and it, it isn't directly, they aren't directly part of my presentation, but um, you know, I watched your, pre your presentation in meetings from, a, uh, from last week. And um, I, when we did the tours, I was able to speak with all of you about you know, what I believe our facilities needs are. 
Um, and I, I really see that we have um, within this department two facilities needs uh, on a high level that come to mind. One is the challenge that we've often expressed that our Quint ladder truck is up to Center Street and that holds minimal water and it has to respond to a large part of that district that doesn't have fire hydrants and, and that's operationally a challenge for us. So from a facility standpoint, we certainly are interested in trying to put future plans in place that would bring the ladder truck into the hydrant district and allow us to put an engine up to Center Street. Um, and the other part to that is, is we certainly have some um, issues with the uh, South Main Street Station in New Auburn with regard to size and, and functionality. Um, and, and I bring all of that up just uh, to talk a little bit about um, your last, last week's meeting. Um, and I don't know what form it takes, but I certainly think that um, a study of all of the public, public safety facility needs um, would be advantageous to us for future planning and how we're going to address our needs. Certainly, you know, I expressed our needs. I know PD has theirs. And I think that a good comprehensive study can try to help us navigate what the best way is to start to get some progress toward our needs and also understand their needs. And, and perhaps that takes the shape of a, a joint facility. Perhaps it doesn't, but I don't think we know that until, uh, you know, we do some kind of comprehensive um, public safety facility needs assessment. And I think that, so I, th therefore, I'd like to at least put my support in for, for um, having a study done of all of our public safety facility needs. Very good. Is there any other questions from the council? No. All right. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Chief. I have a few for you, and uh, don't get mad at me and throw any baseballs. Okay? <laughs> you you go for it. Let's hear them. All right. Protective clothing. Thirty-two thousand five hundred. It happens. It seems like year after year. Whenever will there be a relief where you don't have to spend thirty-three thousand dollars a year? I don't believe there ever will be. And and let me explain how that budget line gets formed. Um, the the NFPA standard is that structural firefighting gear has a a, a useful life of ten years. I have uh, between our line staff and the officer corps here, I have the need to uh, of about 70 sets of personal protective equipment. So on our, our grand plan, we really need to be replacing, just to keep up with the standard, seven sets a year so that it, through a 10 year cycle, um, we continue to meet that standard. Um, the other part that plays into that is, you know, as people come and go, not everybody always fits the size of the hand-me-down that I have left, and so sometimes that is. A set of gear right now, um, full from helmet to um, to boots it will run us about four thousand dollars or a little more um, and so again that's doing seven sets a year we haven't always had that plan and so some years we like to try to do a little bit more if there's the opportunity the other thing that hits that PPE line is uh, some consumable PPE like we're using for um, the coronavirus and EMS and those types of things too that that just doesn't have a lifespan we use it it's kind of gone once hazmat equipment might be one example of that okay that's one down over time for meetings isn't there a, a something that we can do better than almost ten thousand dollars to get the same people on the same day or or something isn't there a better plan i mean overtime has been a hot burn for this city for years and it's still going up instead of down yeah i think it is i think we've done a lot of the a lot of things um but i can tell you uh, just as a brief description of our shift schedule i know you know but um you know our crews work um one day on and three days off so we have four crews rotating on a schedule uh, I'll give you an example of how we use some of that overtime meetings and, and the most recent example. Um, we just had to do the truck committee and wanted to get a te team buy-in and understand the needs of all of the shifts and, and get a collective group together um, and build, if you will, a team to create that decision. And um, whether they come here or we do it virtually or whatever the case is, the reality is if people from multiple shifts are participating in that, we're going to incur overtime from it. So I certainly hear your concern in trying to hold that down and minimize it. We've eliminated a lot of our additional meetings that we could. 
Um, we have brought um, almost all of our EMS training is done in-house now on duty during the shift day, so we don't have those additional costs. Um, so we, we will continue to monitor it, but I do think that there's always going to be a need if we want to get input um, together um, with people from four different shifts that never work the same day, then there's still always going to be a need to, to have some meetings together. Okay, overtime for funeral leave. Can't this yes. come under an emergency fund or something that the manager has in his possession? And I mean, none of us know when we're going to need a funeral leave. And uh, I think it should be an emergency fund, not an overtime fund category. Um, I, I, I can't necessarily speak to where it should come. It, so it is a contractual requirement of us to provide funeral leave if somebody has uh, uh, a uh, close family member that passes. Um, yeah. And so for that, with that regard, it is a cost incurred by this department. Um, and again, that, that overtime, we don't always get overtime um, for a funeral leave, but if it drops us below minimum staffing, then we certainly have to pay somebody to work the overtime. Um, I think that it is most appropriate here because it is a cost incurred by the department, but um, I don't know how else to address it uh, from an accounting standpoint. Well, okay, another question for you for the uh, dry hydrants at Taylor Pond. You've got, you've got uh, a little bit of money put in there. Did, did I not just hear you say we're not doing dry hydrants or we don't? No, I, 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 the, uh, the narrative on that didn't get updated appropriately. If you see that line item went down by $12,000, that money was removed this year. Uh, in the current fiscal year we're in, there was money in there for dry hydrants. Uh, it's repairs in rural areas, uh, including the study at Taylor Pond. Uh, and if you see that line item has gone down by 12000 because it's no longer funded in FY21, uh, because, again, we'll, we'll complete some of that work, $10,000 worth of that work this spring. But okay. I, I apologize. I don't think that narrative got updated. <laughs> All right, uh, small tools, we're, we're still, we're going up in small tools, and again, it's year after year after year that this number never never goes down, it always goes up. How can that continue at this pace? Well. $17,000 and, and uh, you, you've got it listed under small tools. Yeah, I'm going to open up the detail here to see exactly what I had um, for the itemized potential purchases for that. Councilor McLeod, do you want to say something now or is it a separate question after Councilor Walker? I can wait till he's done. Very good. And Councilor Walker, while we wait for Chief here, we, uh, Mr. Manager, I see where Councilor Walker's point is. Every year we fund overtime. For um for funerals or miscellaneous expenses, um, I'd like to know what the actuals are, and is there a different way to account for that, i.e., a drawdown account versus funding at a flat rate annually? Um, because that money unused just goes, you know, it's a contribution to the fund balance. So we just want to see if there's a different way to to look at that possibly, and what the actuals are. Well, we can look at that, but uh, each department uh, has people that have to go for a funeral leave. Uh, sure different times and that's how we account for it that's how most of the municipalities if not all of that but we'll look at it yeah i just want to see what the actual run rates are because there might be a point there i mean if it's actually running at fifteen hundred dollars a year actual run rate then maybe we need not to put five grand in there um just saying okay councillor walker i'm sorry continue or chief all right yeah chief. i can i can give you an idea of what uh we had in mind for the, the small tools, Councilor Walker. Um, we have uh, approximately $1,000 in needs for miscellaneous uh, rope rescue equipment. Um, we have a, uh, two thermal imaging cameras that allows us to see heat signatures and bodies and, and victims in smoke. And uh, the one of the drivers this year is uh, two additional air monitors uh, to be able to monitor for combustible gases um, so that we can be sure we put one of those in the hands of each of our crew. Um, and then other items are kind of items that continue each year. Um, we have a portable vent saw, uh, some scene lighting, and 
some personal flotation devices. Again, that, the PFDs, uh, we, cert we have some on Rescue One, but that would be to try to get a minimum complement on all of our apparatus. Uh, there are some discretionary items in there, but that's what we intend to try to do with those. So small tools is really miscellaneous, uh, perishable items, if you would, replaceable items that you need on the course uh, of the They may not always be, I don't know if I'd use the term perishable, but they would be small firefighting type of tools in the couple thousand dollar range that don't qualify for a, a capital expenditure. And some of it actually is small tools, hammers, screwdrivers, and the like to be able, for us to be able to maintain equipment as well. But it's those small items that on an individual basis might cost you 40 or 50 bucks or a couple hundred dollars, but aren't capital items. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Council okay. Martin. Okay, Chief. This is where I have a real hot burn. I, if, you go, if you go to the description you have on the paper, it doesn't come close to what you told me that you're using the money for. And I understand you need the money, and, and I don't mind saying yes to a budget that tells me what you're really looking for. This account funds small tools primarily used for vehicles and building maintenance. I just don't think it fits that 17700 and that's just my thoughts. You can think about that, and I... I would well, I, I appreciate that. I can, I can give you, no, I appreciate the comment. I can give you a little bit of an idea about my budget formation process. Um, and we really try to understand and plan our expenditures and not necessarily carry a line that we don't have a plan for. Um, but I certainly understand, you know, those, those, those generic um, narratives don't necessarily get into the level of detail on piece by piece of, of how we might um, use those items. I, I understand that. Okay. My, my next one is uh, uh, twofold. One is repair to buildings, one's repair to vehicles. We walked around, all of us counselors walked around with you through your buildings, and you had a lot of things that needed to be done. Yet this budget comes in at 30,000. Last year you had 80. Then you look at repairs to vehicles. I don't know what you spent this year, but 45,000 is what we budgeted last year. And this year, we've got it down as eighty thousand. Uh, Council, those numbers just don't don't sound quite right to me. Um, I had last year building repairs is thirty with a thirty thousand dollar request again this year, and I had vehicle repairs last year's request is eighty, and this year's request is eighty as well. Okay, well, at thirty. If you have a chance, would you have someone look at it, and if it's not right or if something's different? Let me just check a different source here, if I could. Yeah. Just let me know. I, I just, I think you need that amount of money that you've requested for repair the buildings. Uh, I don't know if you need that amount of money that it says in there for repair to vehicles. It looks like the uh, looks like the summary was flipped, but if you look at the detail, it's actually it's the actual. So we'll just need to make that change on your summary sheet. Yeah, I see that. What are you going to change on the? sheet if you look down at your detail sheet uh where it says estimated detail of those line items yeah are accurate at 30 and eighty thousand. One for 30 for buildings and one for vehicles 80 for vehicles just on the top header is where it was flipped that means your summary sheet is wrong as well we'll make that correction So last year, eighty thousand isn't right, or is right for buildings? No, it's not right. La Go ahead, Bob. Uh, it's not right. Last year, the request was thirty thousand dollars for buildings, as is it this year. And I apologize because the ones I'm looking at, uh, my prints today show it that way. Motor vehicles last year, forty-five thousand. No, yes. No, the last year, uh, the current fiscal year we're in, the approved uh, vehicle repairs was 89000 89. And you're going down to 80. Okay, that's, that's fine with me, but it, <laughs> I knew it didn't look right or something was wrong. Yeah, good catch. Okay, the other thing is uh, 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 equipment. The next page is 45,000, again 45,000, but your narrative doesn't say very much. Would you explain 
the 45,000 again. For equipment repairs, I will. Uh, I'm going to open up the detail that yeah. I have. So uh, the equipment repairs line item um, is repairs, uh, it's annual service contracts and repairs on things like our, our extrication tools. But all, additionally, all of our air packs and SCBAs, um, they require an, an annual flow test and periodic uh, pressure tests of the cylinders. Um, those items would come out of that, that repair. Um, air monitors require uh, routine calibration and um, the purchase of supplies to calibrate them and test gases and, and those types of things. Um, so those expenses, uh, that the primary driver for that would be SCBA flow test. That's a big ticket item. That's something that needs to be done for all of our air packs. And then all of those miscellaneous other equipment repairs, such as um, our extrication tool service and those types of things come under that line. Okay, could I just ask that you update that because of the, the way it reads, I, I can't see what you're trying to tell me and it, I think. Yeah, I, I'm happy to provide as much detail on our planned expenditures as, as you'd like, yeah. Well, I just think it, it, it doesn't say anywhere near enough to, to make me feel good about spending $45,000. Yes, sir. I got a couple more for you. Uh, other supplies. This is in the uh, uh, EMS. You're talking fifty-seven thousand dollars this year. If I'm correct, it was fifty-five thousand five hundred. And it, all it says is medical supplies and oxygen for care. Yeah. So the the medical supplies general term that's there that is everything from ppe for our providers to bandages to ivs to saline to all of the medical supplies that we buy to provide patient care are in that medical supplies line okay okay thank you that's i just wanted to know that now you've got under uh, maintenance ve under your vehicles you've got 10500 for uh Repairs and maintenance to the ambulance. If you're going to trade off that third one, will you really need that amount of money in there? You got ten thousand five hundred. Um, I would suspect that our maintenance costs for ambulances. Um, would be reduced if we were to buy. Well, actually, in this fiscal year, yes, we would because the delivery on a new vehicle would not happen within this fiscal year if we place the order. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to. Hear yeah, you but I do that. think I think your point is sound. I think that once we take delivery of that, which would probably be about this time next year, if we were to order quickly, then uh, then I do think the maintenance costs would go down with three new vehicles in place. Okay, ambulance, uh, radio, and tablets for your your. Uh, your ambulances is that that doesn't fall under 911 somehow so that somehow they can be purchased through that the the tablets don't um, the the radios I think that we've uh, through this process determined that we're going to meet the radio needs um, through the 911 upgrade process we've, we've had several go arounds of that uh, about what equipment we would be provided and, and we think that that project covers the radios but the tablets um, aren't part of the 911. That's a cost that we incur on our own to provide those in the, in the ambulance. Okay, very last question. EMT, do, do they require uh, overtime? Do they have to work overtime? Um, all of our employees are uh, available to take overtime. Um, I guess I'm not 100% sure exactly what you're asking. Um, okay, the, uh, uh, overtime, is it all paid out of fire department or is there overtime for the EM? Uh, no, okay, I understand the nature of the question. Um, I, so there, there's one payroll line in EMS um, that is a payroll line. And what that was, if you will, um, probably in fiscal year 18, 17 or 18, just before I came, 
the council authorized um, the chief to hire four additional individuals um, to help drive down the overtime cost. And we've had success at that. And those four individuals were coded to be charged to EMS, if you will. Um, and that's just their base salary, Councillor Walker. So in other forms or functions, if they're working overtime, it hits other overtime lines. Okay. Um, based on what the and, and our overtime is categorized based on what caused the overtime so sick time for example or a funeral or um, a, a meeting um, and and you're right all of those overtimes regardless of the employee that works are charged to those overtime lines not to that EMS line that's just their base salaries thank you chief you're welcome is there anybody else any, Councilor Walker did you have any more questions no I'm done sir thank you you're very welcome. Anybody else? Any other counselor or the question for Chief? I'm going to go with Councilor McLeod, then Councilor Lasagna. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, is there a reason why we don't spread our scuba tanks and our um, equipment further and make them? I know they have to be replaced over a certain time period. Is there a reason why we don't allocate every year, knowing that those replacements are coming? Um, well, our SCBAs, we, we kind of just did that. We just finished a five-year cycle of buying SCBA cylinders um, to try to stagger that increment. Um, but what you typically find, um, we certainly would like to continue to do that. But in a lot of cases, what happens is those purchases occur uh, and are somewhat dri sometimes driven by a grant, having received a grant for them. And, and that tends to drive a, a big bulk purchase at once which unfortunately is a self-fulfilling prophecy and sets you up for needing a grant 15 years down the road for the eventual replacement. But knowing that, we certainly are trying to stagger those, <clears throat> those replacements incrementally. Um, and that's why we did the SCBA bottle purchase in a five-year plan that just concluded this current fiscal year. Okay, thank you. And to piggyback kind of off what Councillor Walker was saying, <clears throat> is there items that we could bring and do in-house like diesel mechanics or fire apparatus fixing stuff we can do in-house as well as the flow testing for the for the bottles and stuff that we could bring home rather than source out sure there is some stuff that we bring in bring home and we continue to explore that um, the flow tests there are not but i can tell you what we have done we've we've built an scba repair team that got um, a field service certification so a lot of our scba scba repairs are done in-house and we don't have to use and send those out to vendors there's a limited scope of that, and then, of course, it's a life-saving device, so uh, we want to be sure that as we get to the higher-end repairs that they're done, but we do do a lot of that in-house. With regard to our maintenance, we, um, the, one of the ways we're trying to hold down our maintenance cost is we're trying to put a lot of our um, smaller apparatus vehicles, and much of that work is being done at Public Works now, which is a big in-house uh, savings. Um, I still, we still continue to work pretty aggressively on trying to hold down our apparatus maintenance costs. Um, for me, that's a, a big stickler that, again, we try to maintain good downward pressure. Some of the stuff we did there um, to try to hold those costs down is we gained a lot of control over our service tickets and when things go out. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of people were kind of authorized to bring something to a dealer and get it fixed. And in a lot of cases, we were getting um, we were inefficient because we'd make three or four service trips for things that we could wait on and go down there at once and only get one service trip and, and reduce our cost. Because like with most mechanics, you know, if you're there 15 minutes or you're there an hour, you, you get an hour charge. And so we've, we've consolidated some of those costs. I, we have been in the administrative team putting a lot of thought into whether or not there's value. Some departments have uh, a department mechanic on staff that can do some level of work. Um, and Right now, um, it, just if you look at our total um, repair cost, which includes a lot of parts, there's not a, an ROI on that to do that alone on our own right now. Um, because I, you know, if you took probably 40% of those uh, total repair costs or parts that we're never gonna do away with the cost of, then that, you know, there, we would certainly more than offset a salary. So right now we're, but if we could create some partnerships potentially, uh, that would be the way to try to bring some more of our maintenance costs in-house. Um, and, and that's something that we're talking about right now. Excellent. My final question, uh, there, I don't remember exactly what line it's on, but it was about 30 plus thousand for OT for events. <clears throat> Is that something, and this might not be a question to you, this might be a question to uh, the city manager. Do we charge or help offset that cost at all when we pay the overtime for large events like the Balloon Festival? 
and items like that where we have extra fire presence or is that just kind of on our own volition? It, it's a good question. Um, we certainly try when we get requests from other agencies um, to do additional coverage for fire protection or EMS coverage, uh, then we do um, try to bill them and reimburse them. Um, but that's not the case. Our budget line gets hit for um, city sponsored events, for example, like New Year's and those types of things for um, event coverage for the, that. Okay, thank you. I would just add there's more than just events on that line item. So. Yeah, I was going to say that covers a lot, Chief. You might want to look at it. Yeah. Council Lasagna. Thank you. Um, Chief, I'm looking at the detail on the professional fees. And they it's for $84,000. And you've got a list, license upgrades for EMTs, outside instructor, instructors, medical billing fees, and medical director. Is there just a, an estimated breakdown for each of those? And what's the medical director? Sure. Uh, the single largest, I can give you uh, the breakdown specifically. The single largest um, dollar figure for that is going to be our medical billing fees. Um, for the $1 million or so plus of revenue we got, um, our medical co billing company charges us 3%. Um, so that's in excess of $30,000 right there um, for our medical billing. Our medical director is a ER physician that um, is a contract employee with the, the Auburn Fire Department. Um, and the, he provides medical direction service to our EMS service. So um, he helps us with quality assurance reviews um, through this current um, pandemic situation. He's helping us with policy guidance on how to keep people safe and then how to implement uh, the new protocol changes that come out, for example. Um, and I'm sorry. He's a, MD, he's a consulting MD, is that, or something yep. like that? Yeah, exactly. He, he's a, uh, an emergency room doctor with CMMC. Yeah. And again, he, he, so he's our, our, our medical consultation. Um, every EMS service is required to have a medical director. The state provides one um, for municipalities that don't, but that person has to cover the whole state. And so um, we get direct contact. He's very accessible and available to us to provide that. What does that cost? $8,500 a year. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any more questions for Chief? I'm going to ask one myself if I could. Chief, um, we're placing some equipment here. Refresh my memory. The new fire truck would allow us to give Lewiston's reserve truck back to them? Or is this, am I getting my years confused? No, that you're exactly right. So, okay. um, yeah, we had, our old engine one had a significant engine failure back in the summer of 2018. Mm -hmm. That started the budget request process for this new engine, and Lewiston has given us use of their old engine one since then to fill the gap for us. So we'll return that one. Um, also, on the old ambulance, is there a resale value to that? I'm assuming you're going to strip equipment, of course, um, as needed. Do we have any... Yeah, yeah, there would be. Um, two years ago, in 2018... Um, when we did that as part of the purchase with the dealer we had originally bought them from, we got a trade-in value on that. Um, but we have not um, requested a potential trade-in value because we haven't started a bid process on this one, but it would go to sale. Um, I think a, a conservative estimate on the resale value or trade-in value for those would be about $30,000. Okay. Um, no need to keep it as a spare? With our... With our current EMS model, I, I don't believe that it would be advantageous to us to keep it. Okay. I, I will end up with incurred maintenance costs, and honestly, we have some space constraints anyway, so keeping it, storing it. Um, I, I feel very confident we can always keep two ambulances on the road with three in stock, if you will, or in inventory. Um, so I'm not sure that there'd be great benefit to us. Okay, very good, Chief. Thank you. Chief, that's all from the council today. We appreciate it. That was a thorough overview and some great Q&A. Great. Thanks for the time. I appreciate your considerations. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, we're going to move along. 
Mr. Manager of Fringe Benefits? Yes. Uh, Jill, are you on? I am. Okay. Take it away. Okay. Our fringe benefit are uh, all of our, um, like our health insurance, uh, Medicare, FICA, our retirement plans, and um, cafeteria plan, those types of things. Um, actually, this budget has a 3.6% total increase. Uh, well, probably the largest increase um, dollar-wise is the health insurance. We had a 9% this year on our health insurance premiums, which was actually lower than the average for the plan. Uh, through, we go through the health trust, Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust, and because we um, have a large number of employees that are in the plan, we are increase is based on um, a blended rate of their actual plan rate and our um, activity and the number of claims and so forth. So we were actually about 3% lower than the uh, standard increase of the plan. Um, Medicare and FICA have not increased at all. Main state retirement, uh, we had a slight increase uh, with our employer contribution. Um, the increase in that is due to increased wages, as most of these are. The ICMA retirement plan, um, we have seen a, a swap from uh, quite a few years ago. More people actually went into the main to the uh, ICMA plan when they came to work here, and people are tending to choose main state retirement over ICMA at this point. Um, so we've had a drop in that. The city pension plan is a plan that has been in place for uh, a number of years, probably, well, it's over 30 years. Um, before Main State Retirement existed, the city had their own pension plan. We actually only have two participants who are still alive. Um, and so that's why that has co continually gone down. Um, the cafeteria plan, um, that helps pay, uh, that, I believe that one helps pay the, um, flex benefits, um, and, um, and then we have the health reimbursement account, which, uh, by contract, the city provides, when we switched over to the POS, or the PPO 500 from the POSC plan, um, we had a deductible, which we had never had before, and uh, in order to um, make the switch less painful for the employees, the city uh, contracted in their union contracts to pay the, the deductible. Um, the deductibles have gone up some, and the contribution to the deductible is not the full amount anymore, but um, it did go up a little bit with contracts. Um, then unemployment, we pay only for those people who actually file. We, you know, we pay as we go. And the salary reserve account is, we have, um, if, if uh, contracts, union contracts are already settled, the increase in wages goes into the department. If the contract is not settled, but is in negotiations, um, I think we have a couple of unions this year that are in negotiations right now. We put um, money into this reserve account for increases uh, for those unions, but it's not a specific to that union, so that uh, there's a, a negotiating tool, but we do set money aside for that. That's what that's for. I'm sorry, Jill, quick clarification on that. That salary reserve line item, or maybe Peter, do you already increase salaries on departments that are in negotiations to compensate for potential increases? No, if they're in negotiations, the money's in this account. If they okay. have a settled contract for, 
Example, MSEA signed their contract last year, I believe. So theirs is already, a guarantee, they get a 2% plus, um, they get, have a merit increase. Um, but it's a 2% cost of living increase. And then um, upon completion of their evaluation, they are eligible for up to 2% merit increase. That was part of the contract. So that shows in those employees' wages in the budget itself because it's already been negotiated, it's already been signed off. Okay, thank you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I will. Oh, that's it? Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> any questions for the council? Councilor Rosanya? Um, can we go back to that page um, that showed the, uh, yeah, the one that we were just looking at? Yeah. My question is again about the salary reserves. And so if we're setting aside so that we can pay employees in the interim, correct me if I'm wrong, in the interim when there is not a contract, does the money get reimbursed when there is a contract? It just I, I just don't understand why the actual in 2019 was 50,000 and now it's more than three times higher proposed i can try to answer this for you council lasagna so okay. uh, so what you're looking there is an actual not necessarily what was budgeted for the forty eight thousand. Um, so i guess look at it this way the regular salaries in any contract your regular salaries continue year in year out it's mm -hmm. just the negotiated changes so we don't necessarily want to advertise what our what our amount will be for negotiated changes. Mm -hmm. So as Jill said, you've got three contracts that are negotiating. We put an amount in there for potential reserves. If, an, if a department happens to go uh, over in their line item, because say we negotiated that in afterwards, and it's a, towards the end of the year, Jill sees where that's going over, and it's as a result of an increase in cost of living or uh, a step increase that happened in negotiations. She will transfer that amount over to that line item within uh, the department. So that way they're, they're not experiencing that overage because it was allocated here. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. Do we, do we imagine that it's, we're going to need this much of a, of a reserve in the coming contract negotiations? Well, you've got three units and um, in their, your largest units. So, um, so it, could, it could be all of that, but it depends on what's negotiated. And it will only be what's negotiated for, like Jill said, for FY21. Any future, um, if it's a multi-year contract, that just goes in FY22 and it'll just be budgeted in. Like what Chief Chase was just talking about, there was no money allocated for the FY20 for that cost of living. So that's why it had the 2% plus the 2% for the upcoming year that we now know of. And then it was a 2% transfer from the retirement health savings for a total of a 6% increase in that line item. Thank you, that's right. really helpful. 145,000 is not here anymore. It actually is under the fire department budget. Right. So the yeah, other thing in that salary that reserve account, um, just to, uh, is that, we did the salary um, survey. Compensation study. It, um, this is for the supervisors at Public Works, right, to bring them up to what the salary survey um, talked about, where they belong. Well, I think it's the equipment operators, Jill. Oh, okay, whichever ones it is, it's yeah. somebody. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Public Works. The equipment oh, operator. That's really helpful, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, is there any other questions on fringe benefits? Councilor McLeod. Thank you. All right, Joe, three quick questions. You said we had two people still on the city pension. Do you know roughly when they retired? Um, well, one of them is a spouse uh, of a retiree who the retiree has since passed away. Okay. Um, the last person that retired on this plan was like in the uh, – late 80s okay so it was a good 35 years ago probably at least okay. um, and 
I could get you his age if you want wanted. Um, I have it. But nope, I'm not asking that question. I just wanted to know roughly when that stopped. Yeah, it um, was it was over 30 years ago that it stopped. Yeah. And, and I just want to I just want to um, chime in there as well. Um, the spouse would then be entitled to the pension at a reduced rate um, after the the person has deceased if their spouse was still alive. Right. My okay. grandmother. Um, is there anything we can do to lower our insurance? I know it's a 9% increase. Is there anything we can do as a city to help bring that down? Or is that we're stuck? Well, historically, the city has done quite well in that area. We've averaged a 3 to 5% increase um, over the last few years, which is really very, com very good compared to many municipalities. I, I think we had a, and Jill put it well, um, even with this increase, it was less than than uh, other municipalities in the plan. Okay. And my final question is about the unemployment line. You said we self-insure our unemployment as we go? Yes. So if we were to furlough or uh, have a bunch of people unemployed right now, we would be paying their salaries or a portion of it out of our funds? It would not be going through? That is correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. That's yeah. That's correct. That Thank correct. you. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Any other questions? None. Okay. Moving along. Next on the agenda, Mr. Manager. Who was that? Yes, Holly Olivier. Holly, are you on? She's not. One moment. She might. She might be napping. I saw her working today, making food for hundreds of people. <laughs> she looked exhausted. She's done a great job. Along with everybody else who's been involved with that program. I am here, folks. Holly, you are up. Okay. Good evening, folks. I'm Holly Olivier, the manager of the Health and Social Services Department. I'm here today with my FY21 budget for your consideration. And for the upcoming fiscal year, I'm actually seeking a decrease of just over 10% um, in my assistance budget. And part of those decreases are for $2,000 for electricity, $2,000 for medical, which is primarily prescriptions, decrease of $10,000 in rental assistance, and a very small increase in cremations and burials. And those are the only line items that I'm seeking to be increased for this FY coming up. And this will be a basic overview for why I'm seeking these changes. So for housing, um, this continues to be a challenge for us. The individuals who may qualify for help with my office, they're still unable to find the vacant apartments here in the city within the general assistance guidelines. Um, as I've mentioned before, my rental maximums are very low and it's been difficult for individuals to locate available apartments that meet that criteria. For electricity, uh, we're seeking a decrease here as there's actually been additional funds made available through the LIHEAP program and LIHEAP stands for the Low Income Heating Energy Assistance Program. And that's through the Community Concepts Office. People apply in Lewiston. You can apply over the phone, online. And that assists with electricity bills and heating costs. And as of March 4th of this year, approximately $4.57 million was appropriated to the state of Maine for the upcoming season. So that's, that's a good amount. For uh, the medical, which is prescriptions, this decrease is being sought because we have had more individuals applying for the main RX card. And that's another program that's recently been made available that's easy to apply. You can go right online to mainrxcard.com or they have a 1-800 number. And that card is accepted virtually everywhere, uh, pharmacies all around. So that's helped to offset a lot of my uh, prescription fees. 
And obviously, another decrease is due to the fact of the lack of influx of the new Mainers. And that ties back into the, the lack of housing. Um, the folks come in and see me, they want to live in Auburn, they just simply can't find a vacancy here in town, and they're being forced to look in other municipalities for housing. And the minimal increase in the cremations and burials category is due to the fact that the state has increased the maximum for a cremation from 785 per person to 1025 per person. Uh, normally, we only see three or four of these a year, folks that need assistance. So I kind of did the math and, and figured it for five individuals for the upcoming fiscal year. So overall, this budget for assistance equates to a decrease of approximately $13,585 for FY21. Um, there is a 1.95% increase in salaries, which equates to about $1,500 for the upcoming fiscal year. And I believe I have reminded you folks before that any benefits that are expended by my office, we do get reimbursed by the state at a rate of 70%. And I do submit those reports monthly for reimbursement. So we see that um, come back as a, as a reimbursement line once a month to finance. So I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. Uh, I'm sorry, before I open it up, I see some hands. Just, could you, for the new counselor's benefit, uh, Holly? Yes. Could you give us the trend line over the last couple of years on decreases? Because last fiscal year, if memory serves me correctly, you asked for a 10% overall decrease in your budget as well? Yes, that's correct. Um, again, it's it's all boiling down to the, the one common denominator. It's the housing. Um, we've had a couple of landlords who were vendors in the city that sold off their apartments and the folks that bought these new buildings either they increase their rent to more than what i can pay or they simply don't want to accept a city rental voucher so it's it's been a steady decline over the last couple of years yeah. uh, i'll start with councillor boss i believe in councillor design thank you holly for your presentation was your budget crafted prior to the covid pandemic it absolutely was, and I'm glad you asked. Um, we actually submitted this budget to Jill Eastman, I believe the end of December. So it was prior to the widespread outbreak of COVID-19. Um, you know, if I had to give an educated guess, I feel that the FY20 budget would be impacted more than FY21 if I needed to offer any emergency assistance to folks. And I think that I have a little wiggle room still in this FY20 budget so that if folks did need emergency help, I do have some, some room in there to do so. Thank you. I think it, and also, do you have any assurances that, um, I see you're talking about LIHEAP and the program through Community Concepts. Are we, are we assured that that funding will remain available to us? I'm, I feel uncomfortable removing money from this department in particular right now on the assumption that other programs are going to be running when we're not sure what anything is going to look like across the state coming exactly. forward. Exactly. We, we were notified, my department, by the state that on March 4th, $4.57 million was set aside for the state of Maine for the upcoming season. So I'm hopeful that that figure will stay in place. But do we know anything about how that'll be distributed among municipalities though? Councilor Boss, and, and there's more money available in the CARES Act too, I believe. LIHEAP was specifically targeted for a pretty substantial increase. I'm not sure what main split is though. Right, I, I, I can't say the numbers exactly where they break down, but it is an increase of funding over last year. So hopefully that will stay in place. And as of last month, it was still going forward with that total. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Zani. Thank you, Holly. I appreciate this. And um, I'm sort of piggybacking on uh, what uh, Mayor Levesque said, this idea about reducing your uh, budget 10% last year. I can't remember if the year before it was also reduced, but this is dependent on housing that's available um, for uh, those with low incomes who need it. And to me, 
I appreciate, and this doesn't have to do with the work or what you can control, but I'm concerned that we're seeing these decreases in um, funds being used because Auburn is not, does not have significant housing for people of low income. And that should be informing some of our economic development work. Now that we're seeing, you know, as Mary Levesque says, we're seeing a real trend here. Yes. In available housing. And for us to not be able to provide safe and healthy available housing, to me, um, says that, especially over the period of time, that we need to do something about this. We can't just expect, again, Holly, it's not you that I'm talking to. This is a bigger issue. But I think the city needs to incorporate this into our economic development planning. Um. I will say this on economic development, I'd love to hear at a future workshop, but usually the best way to fix this problem is to increase supply. Um, so demand lessens. And Ms. Olivier, what is your maximum, we just passed the increase, what's your maximum GA assistance monthly for a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment? Okay, for one bedroom, the most I normally would pay would be 650. And a one bedroom- No, no not even close. Just, just to clarify this, a one bedroom is not for a single individual. For a single individual, we can only pay for a room rental or a studio apartment. That is between 500 and 550, depending on if electricity is included. Mm -hmm. For a one bedroom, which is for two individuals, we typically pay 600 to 650. Yeah, so it, it is on. not, it's very low. And a lot of landlords do not want to accept city vouchers. And again, most apartments do charge increases of that amount. So, And are those, those amounts are, are set by whom? The state. It's based on the fair market value of the property in the area. So the, the whole Androscoggin County area, that is our maximum amount. If you were to look at Cumberland or... York or any other counties, those overall maximums would be a lot higher than Androscoggin. And I bet if you look at some of the outlying towns in Androscoggin uh, County, Livermore Falls, uh, Mechanic Falls, those right. rentals are substantially lower than Auburn's. Exactly. Uh, and I think they take county. the average of all that, and that's what we get for the whole county is what the average is of all the surrounding towns. So this could be addressed in, in two ways, either the state raises the, the uh, maximum, or we work to provide healthy, low-income housing that meets that amount of rent available. Exactly, exactly. I Unfortunately, I, I don't have any control of what the state gives yeah. me for these guidelines. Mm -hmm. Every October 1st, we do see our new um, increases go into play, so the, the overall maximums coming up starting October 1st might be substantially more, but I don't usually get notified until the beginning of September as to what those increases will be. Mm -hmm. Councilor Gary, you had your hand up and I'll come to Councilor Milks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was noticing you don't have any line items for or money for transportation to help those that you're trying to assist get food or medical appointments. I mean, I know there's main care and Medicare, but there's also our, trans our Lewis and Auburn transit bus. So how do you get people around? Like I said before, we, we have access to bus passes here. It hasn't been a real issue in the recent past because folks are living all right in the downtown area. But I, as far as I know, I've never had an actual line item for transportation. So thank you. Councilor Milks. Hi, yes. Um, question on the qualifications for the rental assistance. Um, is there maximum uh, income levels that, and, and are these long term? And I, I, I remember we went through, and I apologize, I'm, I'm still fairly new at this whole process. Absolutely. What are yeah. the requirements, the, the maximum earnings requirements for somebody on that one bedroom, say? Okay, for one bedroom, that would be for two people. Mm -hmm. The household of two in a 30-day period cannot make more than $786 in that 30-day period together. If they so, do, they're considered over income. So that would be if they had TANF, does all those um, yes. supplemental type yes. things that all, okay. 
TANF counts as income. The only thing that does not is the SNAP card, and that's the supplemental food card, mm -hmm. the, the food stamp card, and we can't count that as income. But child support, TANF, anything like that, that is an income qualification that we would take into consideration. Gotcha. So somebody that want to live in a $750 apartment, you're giving them $650, they can't supplement it for $100 or $150. Are well, they allowed to do that? I don't tend to do that because typically if someone's looking at an apartment for $750 and their income level is $786 or below, I mean, that only leaves them $36 a month in excess of their rental fee, if that makes sense. Yeah, but we give them $650. I, I could do that, but I, I try to steer away from that because I, I stick to what the state gives me. And if I start paying portions of rent, that could turn out to be a problem down the road. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so when I'll take Councilor McLeod, I believe you had your hand up. Yes. Thank you. Do you know roughly, uh, you said you can't find apartments. Do you know roughly how many families or so this past year you weren't able to help? Apartment wise, I Guess don't have an exact number, but I would say dozens, dozens. Um, there's some weeks where I have two or three families come in a day looking for help, and then there's a week or two will go by and I don't see any new folks. So it's, I would guess between 40 and 50 this past fiscal year, um, if not a little bit more. But I think unfortunately the word's gotten out that that Auburn's very limited in housing at this point in time. Okay. Yeah. So, Olivia, you, can I follow up on that? Have you ever yeah. done any follow up with those 40 or 50 families or individuals, units, if you will, to find out how they ended up after they left your office, let's say 30, 60, 90 days afterwards? I have not, but that certainly would be something I could look into in the future to keep, you know, kind of a record of what happens after they leave Auburn, for sure. I think I think that could help influence some yeah. of our decision making going forward. Uh, exactly. Some of these people, I'm sure, got jobs and right. are working and fine, you know. Yeah. Um, but it might just be good. Some of them are. Some of them might be living in another town. But it'll be yeah. interesting, I think, to look at that and maybe trend it out a little bit, at least one step. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Is there any other questions? If not, Councilor Zanya. Just, I wonder if this is the kind of thinking that could be a part of our economic development discussions. I know. Usually subsidized housing does not fall under economic development, though. Then it's where would it? It's under low-income housing, but it's not economic development. Well, somewhere we need to have a discussion about how do we address the, the issue that Ms. Olivier is talking about. Okay. Very good, then. Any other questions? None? Thank you very much. Thank Ms. you. Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Next is Chris Muma our human resources director. Chris, are you on the line? I am. I apologize for not having a camera. I uh, intended on uh, being here from home and um, decided with the power outages to come back to my office, which doesn't have a camera. So um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Chris Muma, uh, representing the human resources department. Uh, this year, um, I have small but some budget drivers, um, a 2% salary increase that pretty much mirrors the colas of the bargaining unit, um, $150 added to the EAP fund. This is specifically for a drug counseling um, required by the state when a CDL driver fails a drug test. We're required by law to provide drug counseling. Um, this increase was just um, a standard um, cost, uh, costs have gone up increase. We rarely, rarely have to tap into this fund. If you look at past years, um, we just have never really tapped into it. Um, we have uh, $570 added to the drug testing and physicals account. This is more on uh, the pre-employment physicals. We've had uh, numerous people who have been hired and then um, two or three months later take other positions with either the um, other municipalities or the private sector. So 
our hiring processes have increased, um, but uh, people aren't necessarily staying. They're moving on to better opportunities. So I have increased that um, account if the trend remains the same as it, as it has in the past two years. Um, there's uh, $150 to the office supplies, and that just really is because our chairs and uh, some of our furniture is just getting old. So um, again, not a huge increase there. And then lastly, there's a $300 increase to the travel and seminars account. Um, we, uh, Sherry Buck is a super user for Munis um, through Tyler Technologies in the city of Auburn. Uh, because of our um, expertise in Munis, has been able to acquire free conferences for our employees, but uh, we have to pay for the travel and the uh, air in the um, hotel. And next year's conference is in um, Texas. So there's a little bit of an increase there for that. That's okay. <laughs> that just, just kind of explained everything there. Uh, we also attend um, uh, the main uh, human resource conference that we fund every single year. And then uh, both Sherry and myself are um, uh, looking for uh, more certification through SHRM and the IPMA HR site for in International Public Managers Association. So. Any questions? Good on my end. Council? Councillor McLeod, you're on mute. I got questions for everybody. Uh, I saw a $3,000 line item for advertising of new positions. Um, it was discussed last time if we were to possibly have an advertising budget. Would that line item go away if we were to have more of a communications person and, and an ad budget to do all that together? Uh, Peter, um, that's it for you. That sorry, question. that might be the manager's question. My mistake. Yeah. No, that's fine. I mean, that's something that we could look at doing. Uh, the the money that is there is for uh, obviously advertisement. Um, what we're looking at more with the, the rearrangement or the restructuring uh, with the community outreach division and city manager's office is the marketing of the city and, and, and how to improve internal as well as external communications uh, as opposed to advertising, but we certainly could, could look at that as well. Yeah, it's not, I will say this again, I, HR advertising is definitely, I think I'll echo what the manager said, um, advertising for positions. It's specific, focused, indeed.com, so on and so forth. However, HR and municipalities uh, try to find people so I, I wouldn't put it under the brand category. I'd probably just leave that with HR, just in my opinion. But it's we've got to be thinking about it across the board. I saw that line item with fire as well. And I'm not sure how they advertise or for what need. So, but again, something worth it. Deep dug. Any other questions for H Human Resources? None? Okay, that's quick and easy. Any complaints on the mayor? None whatsoever. All good things. Let the minutes reflect that. Thank you very much. Oh wait, Councillor Milks has something. Councillor Milks? I no? No, I'm sorry. You... I thought you were saying complaints on the mayor. Oh, well, fair. <laughs> very good, very good, fair enough. No Councillor Milks is complaining against the mayor. Thanks, Christine, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next we have Paul Frazier, our IT director. Mm -hmm. I am present. My screen just went blank when I when something changed here. I've been watching you right along, and suddenly I went away. I see myself we, in the corner, so I'm going to. We can hear you, Paul. I'm going to proceed as though you can. I'll, I talk to myself a lot of the time, anyway. So <laughs> I'm pretty comfortable doing that. I do not have a camera set up, and I make no apologies for that. You, you all know what I look like, and if you've forgotten since our last meeting, just picture a cross between, say, Robert Redford and Paul Newman, and you'll pretty much have, have a sense of what I look like. Um, so if we could go right into the, the meat of the uh, presentation here, the most dramatic changes in 
the IT budget uh, this year is, or next year rather, will be a reduction in staff. We are mooch, and this is not a reduction or a removal from the organization. This is a transfer of personnel that are going from IT to the uh, communications group that the manager is setting up under Liz Allen. The two, two of my staff positions, which naturally have a communications connection, are being moved to that, uh, that location instead. There's also a decrease in our purchase services since the GIS position is one of the ones being transferred to, to communications. It, may, it was reasonable that we would transfer that portion of our purchase services consulting over to there as well. Um, the other changes are a, a $2,000 increase in computer hardware. This along with the, the base amount will be used to replace computers. Uh, we are looking at upgrading some switches throughout the organization to uh, take advantage of the, the bandwidth that we have now. And it's become especially important as we've changed our business model here for the last month and then probably the next one going forward. We've had to purchase some equipment and we want to maintain that and, and keep that trend going. Computer software, that $3,000 increase is a, a constituent management application that's part of Esri that will also be used by the communications group. So all of those communication pieces tie into the strategic plan process and, and identified as one of the uh, major, major goals to get, to get started on. The last increase is a software licensing increase. That's a 1% increase on all, all of our software is licensed, of course. And most of the contracts for those have a provision in it for the occasional increase. The vendors typically are pretty careful not to push it too far because they know if we get too stressed, we'll just switch to another, another application. But it's, uh, that's a 1% increase in that. In aggregate, this is a 14% decrease in the IT budget. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that might come up. Okay, I'm gonna get my screen. Is there anybody that has any questions for IT? I'm glad to see the budget's going down. Eventually, we will not need IT anymore. <laughs> Computers will be obsolete. And we'll repurpose you. We, we, will, we will plug staff directly into the network through a cable going into a port in their necks. In the back of their neck, yeah. I, yeah. I saw the movie. Yeah, we're, working on, we're working on that already. I think, you think we'll call it the Matrix, but, but we haven't settled on that name yet. It's a good name. Is there any questions for Paul in his <laughs> department of institutional terminology? Councilor McLeod. Just one question. It's a huge line item for our software. Do we regularly check for other softwares that might be cheaper? I know we, it goes up 1%, you said, roughly, or incremental. But over time, that could be a lot compared to uh, a newer software or a different type of software. Do we look into that regularly just to see what's out there? We do. Um, Every one, every piece of software, especially the major ones, we regularly monitor just to make sure that they, they're still the, what they need. Not so much is there a cheaper version of it, but is it something that we still use and it's still the best fit for our needs? Our needs are changing constantly. So a lot of that, you know, there may be pieces of software that we used in the past that are no longer relevant and those would have obviously get changed. I'm not anticipating any major changes in 21, uh, but that's always, we're always looking for making those changes and ready to, to, to switch if, if that becomes the reasonable choice. Are those line items for licensing for just the city or the entire, like the entire city, including all of our departments? Yes. Is school department separate? School department is separate. Okay, perfect, thank you. Very good. It, it, Paul, major uh, software driver is Microsoft Office? Uh, no, actually, that one's hmm. not the major one. The, the biggest piece is the Tyler Technologies, our, our financial package, yeah. our, our like business licensing, permitting, all of that are through Tyler. Uh, Munis is our primary application, and a good chunk of that licensing is the Tyler licensing. We pay 55000 a year for the Office 365, and that's for 280 seats. 
So that's ours and the, um, the, the comm center as well. Okay, actually, actually pretty decent. Okay, very good, thank you. Is there any more questions for IT? None? I think we're all set. Very good, have a great awesome. evening and stay safe. Um, thank you, Paul. You too. Peter, it's yes, seven o'clock now. Um, I'm tempted to give the council a fiver. Okay. Are you good with that? Do we have, uh, we have other people ready to talk though, correct? And present, Marsha, I see her. Good evening. Good, hey, Marsha, would, you, would it be terribly bothersome to give the council about five minutes to stretch? Oh, go ahead, stretch. <laughs> no problem. Okay, very good. Then I think, council, are you good with that? You wanna take, we've been at it for about an hour and a half? Thank you, Marsha. Sure. Um, so, Council, it's 7.02 right now. Let's just stand in recess for five minutes. We'll come back to the workshop. Fair enough. And, Brian, if you could just take us offline for five, that'd be great. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark.
back in workshop and I'll turn it back over to the city manager on intergovernmental affairs line item. Thank you very much, Mayor, Councilors. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to introduce Marsha Bennett. Uh, Marsha is the LATC coordinator. Did I get your title right, Marsha? You wear a lot of hats there. Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good title. All right. Um, I don't know where to start LATC's uh, presentation because since this budget that was in the packet was presented, some things have changed. Um, so I guess we'll just, the things that we know that are in the budget, um, they're on your screen and it has um, the increase for fixed route contract with Western Maine. There's a 5.1% increase in that contract and a 0.7 increase for uh, the ADA contract. The budget was originally presented to the city was a little higher than what, well, I'm not even sure what number you're seeing now because it had been revised, but there was a, a number of 508,000. That number was originally 529, but we had to, we ended up reducing it because the contract for fuel uh, with the city of Lewiston came down quite a bit. We had budgeted at $2.54 a gallon and it actually came in at $2.13 a gallon. So that was a, a pretty substantial savings. And the number of miles that we were using to the um, number of gallons, we ended up reducing that. Uh, if you all recall in J January, the fixed route system, we ended up increasing service. It was part of re-establishing a full level of service that reflected the 2016 service levels and in order to phase it into the budget it was the first three months of the fiscal year was at the lower level of service and starting in january we were going to phase in additional service we weren't miles we would be looking at so the budget was recalculated based on miles from um, january and february it showed um, the additional route miles and the changes to the system um, other line items uh, in the budget, there's um, some minor changes to the bus station, um, which reflected an overall increase of $1,200. Staff has been increased by $10,000, and this is in part, actually it's all in part to a new federal requirement that has to do with safety. There's um, a passenger safety plan that has to be in place by July 20th. And with that safety plan, there's a list of rules, requirements that you must follow on all things safety. You have to, anytime there's an incident that occurs, you have to have a chief safety officer to respond to that. So it's basically to cover um, staff time for that, that role. Fairbox is, has been reduced significantly um, from what we were anticipating. The service cuts you know you're going to lose fare box but then even as you replace and put service um, back into um, place it takes a while to gain the public's trust and to get them to start riding again so looking at how fare box was coming in we ended up reducing fare box um, quite a bit um, based on what we were seeing for 2000 um, 19. So we, that was reduced, reduced budget in ADA. Um, the local share, this is changing. The original, it would have been a 52% increase for Lewiston and a 53% increase for Auburn. Um, that's pretty much out the window now uh, with the passing of the CARES Act. And this is, I'm not sure what LATC is going to be looking at from the cities for a number moving forward um, because the CARES Act is 100% funding and that covers all, all operating costs going to affect the 2020 budget and it has no end date so it's going to affect the 2021 budget. LATC hasn't had a chance to look at how the CARES Act is affecting the budget. They'll be meeting on Wednesday. So internally, I'm not sure um, where administration and finance are coming at for this budget. But I sent out um, 
to everyone last Friday a revised budget for FY20 um, and then and a revised budget for FY1. With the CARES Act, because it's 100% funding and it kicks in starting March, uh, sorry, starting April 1st, um, the 100% funding would actually leave a balance in local funds of 300, and, this is an estimate of $385,997 in the current year. So that money could either be repaid to the cities or put into a, a reserve account um, for future operating. Moving forward, <clears throat> balance of whatever the CARES money is left, which it's $2.5 million that the urban area, uh, the Western urban, urban area received. That money is carried over into FY21 and putting the budget together and the funding sources that were out there. Um, if it was 100% if there's no expiration on that CARES money, the local request per each city is $65,000. So depending on what is done with the local share carried over from 2020, it um, basically there'd be no, no local share required if that money was used. Um, that being said, it's a federal government, so things are up in the air. You never know what's going to happen. The money was dropped into our lap. The money could disappear. They could put an end date on it. Um, as of right now, there isn't. It's spent end it as fast as you can. That's what we've been advised. You can't spend it ahead of time. It's on a cat. It's on a reimbursement basis, so we can't draw the funds down in advance. So I put together a second budget scenario that shows um, 2021 funds. If the CARES money did end and we were relying on just the regular urban allocation and for the fiscal year, that amount per community is 357,942. So there's right now there's a few things up in the air as far as what number the committee is looking forward to presenting to the cities and how the cities want to um, move forward. I, I will say since the um, service increased in January and Fe February before the coronavirus um, impacted everything, we are seeing an increase in ridership. Um, actually, October through uh, December, there was a ridership for each of those months over last year for the same time. It was about a 5% increase each month. And then January and February, when the service increased, there was a 12% increase in ridership over last month. So the um, improvements to the system, the additional service hours, and the changes to the routes was definitely having um, a positive impact um, for the system over, overall and for the, um, for the community. So a lot of moving parts. Uh, um, I I'm not sure how how it's how it should be presented moving forward. Yeah, Mr. Manager. Before we go into questions, I'd like to propose um, a couple things here. Um, I think I think Marsha and team need more time, and I'd like to I'd like to delay them coming back until two things happen. A they come up with some concrete plans, Marsha, you and your board, uh, some options. Um, this might be a good time to get together and at least have, you know, Mayor Kerr and I speak about, you know, what each council's thinking or convene a session of the um, joint committee. I can't remember the exact name, it's in the charter. Two members appointed by the mayors from each city to get together and talk about a specific topics of intergovernmental importance. And this might be you know, the reason. We've gone away from that in the last, years uh, but it might be a good reason to get that going again mayor i think that's a good idea uh, oh peter you're, you're on mute you don't get a chance to do that very often do you uh, yeah the meeting that we have the LATC, which Councilor McLeod is a member, uh, is this Wednesday, correct? 
So yes. we'll have a discussion. I think that's a good idea, Mayor, that you're suggesting that the council supports that. Um, I certainly uh, think that that would make a lot of sense. And we could come back to you maybe the 27th of April when we have a, a workshop and a regular meeting scheduled um, or another date. Yeah. Council, are you all set with uh, me working with Mayor Kerr over in Lewiston and getting the, uh, the, the Joint City Commission going again, at least on a limited basis? Good? Okay, very good then. I just reviewed this in the charter, actually. I don't know why. I'm glad I did. So uh, I'll, give, uh, I'll give Mayor Kerr a call tomorrow, and I'll work out the specifics with him. Very good. So, Marsha, I mean, we could open up to questions, folks, but unless there's something outside of the budget that you'd like to talk about, um that's appropriate if not i do think this whole budget's kind of a moot point until we can all reconvene marcia am i wrong on that no i i i don't really have any direction at this point from the transit committee so i think if if we could postpone it um and i really think that even um peter and ed coming from administration i think it's there's just some questions that need to be answered and you know maybe have both cities get on the same page as far as how you know to move forward so no i think it's a good idea to wait this is just happening so fast trying to keep up with it and to get the information um we just didn't have it have time to get any answers any real answers okay very good then Councilor lasagna this is just very quick, and Marcia, you may not have the answer to this, but it's just in terms of the uh, your process of looking at a consultant to determine a um, sort of uh, new routes and process and everything for the bus. Is that true? I, I, I you kind of broke up at the beginning. Are, are you talking about the study that yeah. we're going to be looking at? Yeah. Um, actually, that just the RFP was sent out today to five consulting firms. Okay. Um, so that process is underway. Uh, we expect to get questions back, I think it was May 4th, and hopefully proposals May 13th or 14th, I can't remember. But that that just, we got it out on the, out on the street today, so that's in process. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make sure it was moving forward because I think that's, the results of that are gonna be very interesting. Yep, yep, it's going forward. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Marsha. Um, wish we could have a, a more in-depth conversation, but we'll get we'll get to it soon. So Next thank time. We, for once reason. we have information. So thank you. Okay. Very good then. Thank you very much, thank you, Marcia. Sure. Next up is Rick Landman. I see Council Lasagna had it for hand up here. Well, Thank you. I'm just curious, um, when we're looking at inter intergovernmental, we're, we're looking at all of the things listed, correct, tonight? I'm yes. Okay, yes. thank you. We are, except for county taxes, which we talked about at the previous workshop. Yeah. That's part of intergovernmental as well. Okay, thank you. Rick, I think you are up, sir. Okay, uh, the slides that I've I'm seeing are not ones that I sent in, so I'll do the best I can. Um, we are up and running. We have not ever closed. We are, you can go ahead and skip those slides. Next slides, please. There you go. Um, this is, my slides are of very little use to me at this point because they are, they've been made from slides that I sent in. Um, Basically, this is a runway project that's already underway. It's an $8.5 million project that's um, uh, happy to say is underway. Uh, we've got crews working out here every day now. Um, the, the schedule has been adjusted. We've, um, we've had to um, rephase the project so that we started where we thought we would end because that work doesn't require FAA oversight. FAA is not allowed to travel any right now. Uh, so we're kind of doing what we can while we can uh, and waiting for all the normality to come back, hopefully. Um, to that end, uh, we're working on our runway projects. That's uh, a, comp there may be pictures of it here in the next slides. I don't know how to, there. Um, the runway picture to the, uh, left-hand side 
is a resurfacing of that runway in addition uh, at, the, at the end closest to where it says relocate perimeter fence. Um, there's an, an orange antenna that's out there that's going to get moved back and all of that area will be enhanced, raised up some uh, so that it's a safer area. Um, there'll also be a new building put out there and some major changes. We're also at the other end of that runway trying to reduce this, the slope of the hill. Um, that project was supposed to be being done now. Unfortunately, with, with the, without any FAA assistance, all of the navigational aids that are at the end of, of the runway uh, can't be shut off because we don't know when we'll be able to bring them back on. So what we did was we moved to the runway project on the right. Uh, we're down at the very bottom of that picture where it looks like alligator skin. Um, that's where we've started digging. We started digging there last Monday. Uh, our plan is to completely reconstruct that runway and then change the way it interfaces into the runway through taxiways. Um, like I said, this project's 8.5 million and once we get this, this done, all of the uh, surfaces at the airport, with the exception of two, are going to be considered good or better, which means they'll need at least 12, 14 years um, before they will need any big maintenance on them. If I could get the next slide, please. So here's the other two projects that we still have, we also have underway. Uh, we've got the fuel farm replacement um, underway. This is as close to a picture as I could get. Uh, the landslide parking expansion, we kind of ran into a little bit of problem in that we didn't request enough funds, not anticipating the exponential raise in labor from contractors. So we underfunded that one. Uh, we've rephased it. We're hoping when the weather clears that we can go out and start doing some work. Uh, next slide, please. So here are my drivers. Um, Employee retention basically is going to cost me a $35,216 additional. Um, if we could just simply, well, okay. There's also an annual increase in my employee benefits offerings. Uh, the biggest one was the 10% 10, 10 increase in healthcare benefits. The city kind of felt the same thing, but we have our own account with uh, the health trust. So it's, um, it's, it's a little harder on us, I think, than it is for the city. Uh, we did get some cost deferments on some scheduled maintenance. Um, we are modifying some snow equipment so that it will work on the new runway surface, um, meaning the new runway surface will be grooved and we don't want sharp edges or metal blades uh, out trying to plow snow and breaking off the edges of those grooves. Um, also, we're going to get a pretty nice reduction in, in chemical um, de-icing products uh, with, the, with the enhancement of the uh, equipment that we've got. Okay, next slide. On my FBO side, the, the fixed base operation, basically it's a gas station for airplanes. Uh, the labor market is still driving me pretty hard there. My biggest driver for the whole entire year was my, my employees. Um, we've got a really good crew. We've got a great team. Um, everybody's doing their, their job, uh, even today. Um, and so it, it's, it's better to keep the ones that we have with their training and experience and knowledge than go out and try and find new ones. So we're trying to keep the wages from going through the roof, but at the same time, um, keep everybody happy and paid well. Um, the other part of my, my fixed based operation budget uh, anticipates a project that is coming up this year. Um, and because of it, we, I'm not sure exactly how it will impact us. So I've kind of just left everything else the way it is. No ups, no downs on anything else for the fixed based operation. If I could have the next slide, please. So here's basically what my overall summary looks like. My proposed operations budget will be up for revenues. 
and my proposed expenses are actually down over last year. Overall, there's about a 6% drop in our ask or our net earnings. Um, so it basically is uh, about a 6% um, reduction in what we ask for and what our shortcomings is. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know where the slides end anymore. Um, I, with that, I'm gonna just say I'm open for questions. Hey, Rick, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna open up to council if you're okay with some questions. Any questions from the council? I have, I have one question. Oh, I'll go with you, Councilor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, only a quick one. Do we have a breakdown in our books or in email about what he discussed for budget line items? We, we don't have the line items as far as I can see. Peter? No, we can provide you with that information. Yes, please. On all of the, our joint agencies, if you could. Okay. I do have copies of his budget. I will get to you. Thank you. A hey, question, and this, you know, I have a feeling I might have asked this last year and the year before. I'll ask it again, though. Have we ever talked about um, moving, for lack of a better term, I'm sure there's an HR term here, but moving airport employees underneath the city of Auburn's umbrella in order to gain efficiencies on health care, human resources, payroll? Has there been a study on that? I'm not saying the city take control of the airport, but just from um, an accountability standpoint. I, I'm not sure how to respond to that. There hasn't been no study. Uh, right now, my, I don't remember exactly all of the terms in the interlocal agreement, but if the interlocal agreement um, would be my basis of beginning to, to, to look into that question. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what it says at this point uh, i'll be glad to get back with you on that though i don't um i'm trying to think of it. i'm just thinking you know out of the out of the box so to speak and i really don't like that term but economies of scale efficiencies um city insurance could be cheaper than airport health insurance so yeah, i'm not sure if there's anything to be gained there yeah i think there has been some piggybacking in the past but i'm not exactly sure what's allowed through the interlocal agreement so i right. can't I can't answer the question completely at this point. Peter, can we do an internal study? I mean, it doesn't have to be for this budget season, but in the future um, and look at that or maybe uh, Brian, Councilor Kerr, if you can, you know, head that up a little bit too and just explore it a little mm -hmm. without the need of a, an expensive consultant or an out, outside third party. Oh, we could, we could do some comparisons with other uh, areas where they have municipal airports uh, or county airports. Uh, if the council would like us to do that, you'd like us to do that, we can certainly do that uh, for the next budget. Yeah, most, most of the time airports are not uh, uh, owned by two different municipalities. If there's a joint ownership, a lot of the human resources uh, activities all default to the airport so that it's airport specific. Um, Peter, I can address that question. Okay, Chris. Uh, in the past, um, airport did fall under the city of Auburn's um, uh, umbrella for benefits. Um, and the air agencies who work contracted with us, Maine Municipal, uh, Maine PERS, uh, ICMA, did not like that. They, they allowed us to, but they really didn't like it. Um, and so probably about five years ago, I would say, or uh, I'm not sure, Rick, if you were here at the time, I was. Um, we separated. Um, and so the airport was under their own um, umbrella and then uh, we remained on our own. It was, it was just, um, but I don't remember the exact reason why the, uh, the uh, benefits company didn't like it, but um, they really felt that the airport should be under their own entity. Yeah, I mean, we have our own stormwater permits. We have our own um, DEP accounts. We have a, a lot of our own stuff um, rather than what would normally happen with the municipality. And that would all be, um, you know, under the municipality. 
out here we're we're an entity of ourselves i guess is the way to say that not properly though you're like andorra or maybe Liechtenstein. yeah kind of like that yeah um you know we 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 fall under the regulation of auburn but we're really a joint agency with both you know with two owners um it, it does it does make my day interesting if nothing else so <laughs> Council Carrier, do you have any comments on the budget as presented by Rick? You're the council representative of the airport board. The only the only question I had, it's, uh, I had a couple of small ones, and they may be more on uh, operations out there, Rick. Is uh, have we seen any any uh, lowering of fuel cost from this last little go round between Saudi Arabia and Russia? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay, that, that's a benefit. And have we got a timeline from the FAA? as far as when they're gonna get back with us so we can continue the project? Um, if all that is going to be dependent on when travel restrictions are lifted. And so we really don't know, which is why we flip flopped the project was so that you know, we, because we don't know what's gonna happen when the engineers are gonna be able to travel again. Um, we're not sitting out here with nav aids turned off that are brand new and we were wishing that we could get them turned back on so there's, there's no there's no timeline available uh, we are just tomorrow going to get our cares act briefs from uh, faa headquarters and dot tomorrow so we're just now finding out what marsh has already been told so so you might be in the same position that marsh is in a week later yes absolutely so let's put you on the list of potential callbacks too rick I don't think it's going to change my overall budget for this year, though. I'm um, two months from, be, from being done, and I can see the end. I don't see it being a major obstacle for me, like it is for Marsha. Yeah, but because our funding is already in-house, uh, we, uh, we may see some benefits from the CARES Act, but uh, I'll have to see how that applies first. Now, your revenues were already projected to be significantly down due to runway construction over the summer, yep. if memory serves me correctly. Right. It, uh, summer camps, I'm starting to catch wind in the press that summer camps are starting to close or announce yep. closures. They're obviously, a huge driver is parents weekend pick up drop off through private plane. Um, are you anticipating that? Do you feel like you need to take another look at revenue? Um, I'm, if I, I have not yet done that. I have started to gather information. Uh, I really feel like we're too far away for it to be as accurate as I'd like it to be before I start uh, messing with the budget. Um, we go into a new fiscal year the same month that all that activity starts. So I really believe that this fiscal year's budget is going to be fine. It's next year's budget and how that budget um, is constructed that I'm worried about. Um, and I'm, I am thinking about that. Any other questions? No? Rick, thank you very much. And yes, please keep us updated to the city manager and Brian. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next presentation is from Paul LeClaire, the Lewis and Auburn 911 director. Well, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. I hope you can all hear me. We can. Very good, thank you. So uh, so my first slide, uh, essentially just a uh, review of uh, previous year's uh, budgets presented to uh, the councils, uh, approved by the committee. So over the six year period, uh, 15 through 20, uh, the committee has been able to hold budget increases uh, down to 8.5% uh, over that six year period. So they work hard uh, to present a responsible budget and I uh, think we do a good job. Uh, for this year, uh, we're proposing a 2%, the committee is proposing a two overall 2% 2 increase. Our, just have a question if the, uh, the, uh, the council has, can see the LA911 detail or not. So I won't spend a whole lot of time. Uh, our personal services are increased by 2.7%. And essentially the drivers for that increase are, we're in our third year of a collective bargaining agreement with the dispatchers union and then the uh, 
CBA calls for a 2% COLA. Uh, slight increase in our overtime. We're also experiencing uh, the same increase in our retirement costs. Uh, new employees are opting for main state retirement versus uh, the ICMA. So we're seeing a decline in our ICMA costs, but an increase in our main state retirement system costs. Uh, we're also uh, in line for an 8% increase for our health insurance. And we have some, uh, we do have a reduction in our workers' comp fee, annual fee because uh, our experience is fairly good. So our, our costs are going down in that category. And we're having just a slight increase in our unemployment costs. So overall for personnel services, a 2.7% increase. Our contractual services decreased by 3.4%. Four or five percent. Uh, again, what's what would be driving that decrease is uh, the efforts that we're placing uh, towards our new radio system will reduce our reliance on uh, recurring fees for telephone lines, which provided our connectivity. So, over the past couple of years, through our capital projects, we've been uh, in, investing in things like fiber, uh, microwave connectivity. And so this year we'll experience a reduction, uh, FY21 will experience a reduction in our uh, telephone line fees and the same will follow for FY22. So again, uh, it comes from uh, investing in our infrastructure and we own the equipment going forward. Our uh, utilities are up slightly and that's based on uh, a 3% increase from CMP. Our maintenance and licensing the annual fees uh, going up slightly 2%, and that supports our IT and our dispatch, uh, dispatcher software programs. A slight increase to our repairs to buildings, and that is related to the improvements we've made to our four major or primary antenna sites. So we have additional fees for utilities and uh, fuel to support the generator and those, those items. Our supplies and materials are flat funded. Our fixed charges are up two and three quarter percent and primarily due to uh, liability insurance uh, increases. Our capital increase uh, is less than 1% and that's due to the annual increase in our office copier. So it's a small line item increase but it does represent uh, a less than 1% increase. Uh, our revenues, for uh, the committee, we have a lease agreement for a, a cellular, uh, or actually say cellular lease agreement with Verizon at the Grace Lawn Tower in Auburn. Uh, we have a dispatch of services agreement with the town of Poland that generates $41,000. We have an IT service agreement with the Androscoggin County Sheriff's Office that generates $30,000. A year, and we have uh, smaller agreements with surrounding towns. So, LA911 serves as the host for the database used by all the police uh, departments in the area, including the sheriff's office. And again, we serve as the host, and so we in turn charge service fees for the IT, and we also bill out uh, to each of the each of these agencies their annual. Uh, IT services or IT licensing costs. So our revenue for, uh, to offset the operational budget totals $104,521. The committee is also, the LA911 committee has also approved the use of $17,000 of fund balance to offset the operational budget, which brings us down to that 2% requested increase. I wanted to uh, just take a moment and uh, talk a little bit about the uh, previous year's capital projects. Uh, in FY19, uh, the cities of Lewiston and Auburn approved capital projects to improve our radio transmit sites. And this was all in preparation for the new radio system that we're currently working on uh, for implementation. Uh, in FY19, we uh, upgraded our uh, dispatch center uh, stations and also our uh, server replacement which again serves as the host for uh, records management uh, software 
and all of the jail records for the community police departments. And FY20, we're uh, currently in the midst of our uh, radio system upgrade on schedule for fall completion in 2020. You know, just kind of hit the benchmarks for that radio system, uh, radio system project. Uh, we reached an agreement with EF, the EF Johnson Company in August of 2019. Uh, we recently completed the radio system de design review, and essentially the design review was a process of uh, page by page, item by item, uh, going through the RFP and the proposal submitted by EF Johnson to ensure that what we had requested and what they had proposed would meet our needs. And it, it certainly was a much longer than a uh, much longer process than we thought. Uh, actually, it was uh, like a three month process. But uh, the good news is that uh, everything that we asked for is being provided. Uh, we're on budget, we're on target. And uh, the only thing that uh, I could see that would present delays for equipment delivery uh, and installation and final testing would be the current COVID crisis in that uh, travel is limited for uh, currently for everyone, even the EF Johnson technicians. So our next benchmark is a, a radio system factory acceptance. And part of that process includes uh, Lewis and Arbor 911 staff, police and fire chiefs traveling to Texas to essentially witness the uh, the testing of the radio system prior to delivery and installation. And I see that being delayed till at least June 2020. Again, uh, all of the equipment necessary for the system has been uh, collected, delivered to the EF Johnson plant in Texas, and uh, we're just waiting to settle on when we can tra when we can travel again and uh, visit Texas to conduct the factory acceptance. And I'm assuming now at this point that we're more than likely going to uh, experience that one or two month delay. So, uh, but I'm still looking for the fall of uh, looking forward to the fall of 2020 as our uh, the period when we conduct and accept the radio the radio system. So. All is on, uh, on, on schedule and uh, on budget, and um, be willing to take any questions. Very good, thank you, Mr. Uh, Paul. Uh, I'd like to turn over to Leroy. He's the council's rep on the 911 committee. Leroy, do you have any questions or overall thoughts on the budget? Thank you. Uh, no, really, I, I think, uh, Paul and everyone have done a great job to bring it in to right where it is. Good. Okay, thank you. Any councilor questions? Councilor McLeod, do you want to know how to dial 911 or do you have something a little bit more substantial? I don't have an 11 key on my phone. Uh, so I have a, is there, do we know, um, is there a resale value for our old radio system? Is that going to be recouped somewhere or is that just trash? Well, the radio system itself has uh, experienced end of life. It's five plus years, if not close to 10 years, past end of life. So the radio system, again, itself is not worth anything. However, the, uh, the police and fire chiefs uh, still have uh, portable radios that have some value. So I think what we're going to wait to do uh, at the end of, uh, well, when we finally complete installation is, collect whatever the chiefs uh, may not want to hang on to. I think VHF portable radios do have a value. I don't know what the market value would bring, but it's certainly going to be in the, you know, the, unfortunately the 10 to 20% ranges of, of uh, new purchases. So it will have some, some value, but it, it might be something that the chiefs want to pass on or try to, to sell to mutual aid departments who are still using that technology. Perfect. Thank you. I will say, Paul, before we let you go here, that uh, I spoke specifically about the 911 upgrade individually uh, to each member of Congress, our representatives, I should say, back in early March. Um, they were all absolutely just impressed with the level of complexity, the scale and scope, and the newness or the uniqueness of this project compared to other uh, projects around New England. So people are watching. I'm sure they're going to want tours come October, November. So very good job.
Thank you. Looking forward to it. Yep. Thank you. We'll move right along. Next is the budget for mayor and city council. Hold on. I'm sorry, Peter. Do we have anything or line item for arts, the park, and tax share? I mean, art in the park is pretty self-explanatory, but it's a five thousand dollar increase. What we'll do is we'll, have, uh, we'll, we'll end up having recreation cover that yeah. when they're presenting. Okay, very good. And tax sharing. I think Jill's still on. She could probably cover that for us. Well, we'll we can talk about that when we talk about the TIF, which will be next. Well, this Thursday. Okay, if that's so, tax sharing is part of the TIF. Well, we can make we can make it part of that discussion. Okay, very good then. I just want to make sure it's covered. Yeah. yeah. So there's not much change with the mayor and city council budget, as you can see. An increase of eight hundred ninety-three dollars uh, out of this budget. Is the recognition program for the employees, uh, the city's annual audit, uh, the annual New Year's event, uh, which has been a great success, as you know. I don't know if you have any questions, Mayor, if there's anything that you or councilors would like to, to say or. Um, I think I'll open up. I, I have a couple comments. I'll open up to the councils if there's any questions. None. Okay, I'll, I'll make a couple con comments, and this doesn't have to be acted on now, of course. Um, I am weighing the pros and cons of certain group trade associations that I'm part of as a mayor. Um, right now, I'm leaning towards asking Peter to cut that from the budget. It's approximately $3,700 annually. With that said, I will mention that there has been a extraordinary amount of travel that I have done as mayor actually compared to other mayors in Auburn's past. Um, the vast majority, actually all, except one airline ticket, I have I have not submitted reimbursements back for the city. On hindsight, you know, I was doing this out of the, the niceness of my heart, but I also realized that I might have created a slight structural deficit for future mayors and future budgets. I want this council to understand that. Uh, just because I did not ask for reimbursement, um, and the vast majority of this travel, mileage to Augusta, you name it, travel to DC, other mayors in the future should, and I should have. So let's keep that in mind as maybe just a cautionary footnote um, that in order to execute this job and your jobs um, for the betterment of the city, there is work that's involved in this very part-time mayorship. So I just wanted to make that clear to y'all. Any other questions or comments? No, Councilor Zanya? Sorry, Mr. Mayor. So part of that is to say that um, you were able to um, cover the cost of this travel, but in the future, um, the mayor's position may need to include funding to allow him or her to uh, do this kind of travel and attending meetings and things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's I mean, so, hmm? do you give an estimate, or or how do we begin to think about that? You to put it this way: uh, governmental mileage rates. A trip from Auburn to Augusta round trip is seventy dollars reimbursement. So, um, I've probably traveled to Augusta on average of eight times per year. So, just to give you a ballpark, that's you know that's probably five hundred and fifty dollars just on that. Um, travel to D.C., Washington. You know, probably not as neat as much as I've done, but with the MMA and, you know, doing their fly-in, which I participated in, which has been extremely helpful to Auburn um, and the region, actually, everybody outside of, of Portland, because Portland floods the place, those, those meetings. So, I mean, we're talking, I, I'd say I am self-funding to the tune of two to $3,000 annually. So, so on a salary of four, and I'm not saying that for any praise or, or, yeah. or thank you. No, 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 no. That's my choice. Uh, but that's, if you're thinking about this position going forward, and I honestly think we need to this year, especially with a charter review, we need to be looking at the scope of the mayor, what we expect him or her to do, 
and the costs associated for our next budget. So perhaps for the 21-22 budget year? But I thought it was worth pointing out a little to get, to get us thinking about it, leading into that charter review and leading into the next budget season. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions on it, Councilor Gary? You're off, you're off. Councilor, you have to accept the unmute request. Okay. Uh, just for a sake of conversation, I don't mean any disrespect to employee recognition, but why is it in the council budget versus the manager since they are his employees? It's, it's been that way since I arrived. Uh, we haven't made that change. I know it's something that the, the councilors and the mayor uh, have wanted us to do and appreciated it. and. I, I think the employees appreciate the support. Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, I don't want it stopped or changed. Yeah. I just was wondering why it was in our budget as a line item versus yours. That was well, I think it's a, it's it's an indication of support from the council. I believe that's probably why it was put there. I haven't changed it uh, since I became manager. Yeah, I don't have the legacy knowledge on that, but I I, I agree with the city manager on this one. I agree. But you're right, Councilor Gary. They're his employees. But as the city council and you know the leaders of this city, I, I do think it's fitting. And council, any thoughts, Councilor McLeod? I had a different question. I agree right. that it's fitting that we are part of the recognition of our of okay. this council. Can you hold the second question for second council? A thumbs up. We're all in agreement to leave it, or do you want to move it or further conversation? Okay, it looks like I'm getting some thumbs up here. Okay, very good then, Tim. Councilor McLeod. So I just had a question. Do we know how much the city audit costs? Because that's also rolled into that. It's over 20 grand. Jill, are you on the line? I am. You want to address that? Uh, I don't know exactly. I can get you exactly, but it, I think it's around 35000 which includes CDBG, which they pay a portion, and the school department pays for theirs as well. Okay. That's all. the total amount of it is about 35000 and our portion being uh roughly. it's we're at like 58 percent okay i just wanted to know how much how much of the of that was city audit versus community events and recognition that puts it in perspective thank you you're welcome okay. anything else on mayor council budget okay peter i'll turn it back over to you i think that's the last agenda item we have and then we can open this up into a general discussion of points. We can, if people would like to do that. Um, just a, a reminder, we have a budget workshop this Thursday that we will be doing uh, with police, the library, public works, recreation and sports tourism, TIF, uh, tax sharing agreements, uh, we can add to that. Uh, workers comp will be discussed as well. And I would say in terms of uh, questions that you've raised tonight and you raised previously, like we did last year, those of you who are on the council and, and maybe some of you uh, who are new to the council uh, are aware of this. We took one of our meetings and uh, Phil and I answered questions that had been raised up to that point in time. I'm going to suggest that we could do that um, on the 27th of April. Um, we are already starting to get answers to those questions. I can share those with you ahead of time, but we could do it then in a public way so that the public would be able to get the answers. Like, for example, on 911, what the savings is annually, it's approximately 230000 annually, whether you do a population formula or whether you do it by calls. Uh, those kinds of questions that have been raised, uh, we can provide that information if you like at the meeting on the 27th, or if you want to do it differently, we could do it differently. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that too. And I'm, I'm going to speak for myself and, and kind of some counselors and I had some conversation. I'd like to ask the counselor a question. Thursday, April 23rd. Right now we have nothing the week of April 19th or 20th. It's Patriots Day, Monday. Uh, that Monday. 
And we do not have a workshop scheduled that day. I'm not saying I'd like to call an additional date, but I think uh, it's good to keep open right now, just in case we need to have one more workshop and maybe answering, you know, Peter, some of the questions we've had as a council, answering them in preparation of the 27th. Do you mean that Thursday? Mr. This Mayor, you mean that Thursday? Correct, Thursday the 23rd. It would be after all the presentations, um, but it would also, I think, give us some time to have further conversation as a council, answer, get any questions we have answered and leading up to the 27th. And the reason I say that is by charter, the manager's budget's due on April 30th, before May 1st. And if there's any chance that he might want to submit a revised budget based upon these discussions, I'd like to give him more than two or three days. Sounds good. Makes sense? Yeah. yeah, I say scheduled. I mean, if we happen to miraculously be ahead of the game, we don't need it, but I think it's, it would be important to have it on the calendar. Yeah, and we might want to, and the school uh, department might have a revised budget and they want to run that through us too. It just gives, it gives us an extra day to be open. You know, some flexibility around the 23rd to 27th. Okay. Okay, so let's keep tentatively scheduled that in tentatively. We'll make that call on Thursday after our meeting then. Uh, is there any conversations that anybody would like to have regarding the budget so far? Or do we want to continue to hold off on specific budget comments until after all presentations, which is what we discussed last meeting? Mm -hmm. Councilor Rosanya? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciated the explanation in the fire chief's budget. It was very specific. He had all the information and he also went through and reduced some of the costs. I don't know if looking at the other budgets that we're seeing, you know, we had requested people to come back with with um, reducing some of their costs, just like we're asking the school department to do. So I hope the departments realize that this is what we're looking for. Well, I want to I want to clarify: we can't ask department heads to reduce costs. Uh, they can make additions or, or changes based upon reality, corrections yes. or typos. Yes, uh, that all has to go through the manager and assistant manager, but. Um, I think everybody realizes that we're in a, a difficult time here. Peter? Thank you. Mayor, if, if I could, and Council, uh, as you hear these presentations, you've heard more than one department head talk about reductions that they've made. Uh, Bob is a very, uh, Bob Chase is an outstanding fire chief and he presents very well, but I just want to um, underscore the fact that uh, the departments overall, I think, have done a good job in presenting. Uh, their budgets. That why that's why the municipal budget is as low as it is, uh, and you'll hear that again uh, this Thursday when you hear from uh, the other uh, department directors who will be presenting their budgets. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we had a lot of hands up simultaneously. I'm just going to start mentally here, at least on my screen. Councillor uh, Carrier, and then I'll I have just a quick question. <clears throat> We've heard several times tonight uh, <clears throat> the the estimates are going to be changed due to the the care. Do we have a do we have any knowledge of of exactly who is going to be getting care money? Uh, and if so, uh, sort of like we did tonight, I'd like to have a revision if they can find out. I mean, I know the airport just found out about it, but uh, Miss Bennett seemed to be. Uh, fairly well versed on and I'm just sort of wondering how many of our agents or how many of our groups are going to be looking for something like that. Just a, if I may, a quick response on that. Uh, you've heard me speak about the recovery team that Phil and I have been working on uh, that Mark Gosselin is, is heading up. Uh, we actually have uh, people that are looking at the CARES Act uh, to try and, and understand it frontwards and backwards and see what opportunities there might be for the city to be able to save money or take advantage of opportunities. And we'll have a report for you at, at uh, some some point in the not too distant future. Okay. Councilor Zani, you, you had a question? No, I'm sorry, K, uh, Councilor Boss. Yep. Councilor McLeod? Yes, is it possible to get from Jill a spreadsheet of the current proposed budget? So I can play with numbers. <laughs> no. Okay. Thanks. Just kidding. No, just kidding. 
<laughs> I've never had that request. In, even uh, just the either. high level. 35 just, years. Hey, yeah. Some people are very good at saying, oh, if, if we eliminate this or get rid of this, it's going to save X on the mill rate. Having the numbers in the spreadsheet speaks to me a lot better than the narratives that we have. That's all. I can I can send you a copy if if uh, I'm allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> Like Let me sleep on that one. How's that? That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to get a copy of them as well. I, I just from a fiduciary responsibility standpoint, this might be a little uh, unpopular. I don't like Excel versions of budgets floating around. Now, an Excel version of just like the bottom 10 lines for the calculations of mill rates, maybe some sort of calculator, mill rate calculator. That might make sense. I agree with you. Instead of penciling things out, but the entire budget in Excel scares me. Um, and the formula is Council Member Cloud. Sorry, yes, that, that's what I was talking about. Just the high level, like departmental budget, so I can get an idea how much of the mill rate includes a new fire truck and how much of the mill rate would be if, you know, we didn't fund something. Just to get general ideas, because these are huge numbers in our budget overall, millions of dollars. And it would be better to put those in perspective a little bit easier with a, a very high level calculator like that. I'm, I'm not saying that we will not furnish you with that information, but uh, I want to encourage you to send me questions uh, and, and to Phil uh, and we'll do a cross comparison to make sure we have them all. But if you have questions like that, send them to us and, and we will give you the answer. I, I hear you're saying, Councilor McLeod, sometimes it's easier just to work through. And I think, Peter, the point of this, and I, I, I'll speak for myself on this one, um, calculators are great when you're composing thoughts and arguments and you're actually looking at impact quickly. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go anywhere, but I know it helps me. And there's a lot, you know, the, the three primary ways of people learning audio, visual, and kinesthetic, that satisfies the kinesthetic um, category of people. So, Councilor McLeod, I'm not sure if that dovetails up what you're saying, but I, I hear where your, your pain point might be. And instead of bogging staff down, just plugging in numbers and seeing outcomes um, to probably answer half or get rid of questions before they even exist. Or create a lot more of them. Yeah, good, never know. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Councilor Milks? Yeah, we had some of the uh, presentations and we've got a lot of salary line items. I'm thinking the rec department is one. Um, where we only had this year's uh, salaries. We didn't have last year's and there were increases. So I'm, I'd be curious to know, you know, what last year's salaries were, where, where those increases are and, you know, <laughs> where some of the contract, some are contracted without a choice and where there's some discretionary oppor opportunities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the question. Uh, I've got I've got a couple questions. If there's nothing else on the council at this point in time, uh, first is a Google spreadsheet questions and answers for documentation purposes. I haven't seen that yet. Is there an ETA on that one, Peter? Well, we're actually working on it. The, the Google was pretty hard to work with last year. Um, Phil and Liz and I and Kelsey talked about it today. Trying to remember the terminology, Phil, that Liz used. Can you remember? Yeah, we'll be using an ESRI document, so that way there we can easily uh, make that uh, connected with uh, the websites what's available as well for the public. Okay. Right, right. So we are working on it. Well, great. Thank you. And ETA, just when it comes, would be great. And I think the intent is satisfied with that. Um, second, um, we talked about April 23rd, conversion. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yes, that's not it. So that's it for general questions of the budget. I do want to have a conversation with the council tonight. If council, if you're up for it, it's eight o'clock, eight ten. But I want to talk about emergency reserves. And I've, I've had conversations with individuals about this. Um, I've sent all the council my thoughts earlier today on this. Primarily, and I think the, the reason is like this conversation has to happen now is because it's time sensitive because it would require a change to ordinance, which would require two readings, unless we exercise our emergency uh, powers as mayor or city manager, which I'm not recommending in this case. So is everybody okay to have a 10 minute overview on this? Yes. 
Yeah, I'm getting some nods. Okay. Um, so here's, let me set the stage. Obviously, we have annually, we set aside by charter, um, and that section is quoted in that email, half of a percent of our total school and municipal budgets for an emergency reserve account. At the end of the year, end of that fiscal year, that emergency reserve money then flows into the uh, fund balance. Um, that money is set aside for emergencies. We used it this year, I think for the first time and that I can remember, Peter, did we even know the last time we actually used emergency funds before the small business loan program? No, not that I'm aware of, but again, that's, well, go ahead and say what you're gonna say. Yeah. No. So we don't have, uh, so anyway, so we used it $50,000 allocated from that amount um, for what it was designed for, which is an emergency program, which saved 118 jobs by uh, economic developments count, great. What I want to propose, and the, so the charter says the unused amount goes into the fund balance. I'd like to propose this, that in a case of fiscal year in which the city is in a state of emergency, the emergency reserve is carried over as emergency reserve, not goes to the fund balance for the next fiscal year, but is replenished so that it equals half of the then current budget, as well as any monies that were used outside of or from that emergency reserve. So in this case, what we'd be doing is we'd be moving that for the remainder, I think it's like 410,000, 400,000 from this emergency reserve fund to next year, adding $50,000 back into it, which is the amount that we drew down, though drew down a little bit less, but just for argument's sake, Increase that amount again, so it equals half of a percent of the total budget as it stands right now. That's probably another $20,000, 20 to 30. So we'd add another $80,000 or so into it. This is versus the line item that's currently in our budget for $461,000 to add or to create the new emergency fund balance for the next fiscal year, whereas the remaining money will go into our current fund balance. Okay. So basically it's a shifting. What it will do is it will eliminate the money needed from the taxpayers this year to replenish an emergency reserve fund because 80% of it will, will be there, will be a carryover from last year. Again, this is only to happen during states of emergency. Building on the fund balance as a whole is obviously important. Thank you, Phil, for putting this up. I believe that's Phil. It is. Okay. Building up the fund balance is important. There is policy at the city to have the fund balance at 12, um, 12 and a half percent or 12% of our overall combined budgets. Okay, and I think we can look through this, what's going on right now uh, by fiscal year. And I'll let Jill, Peter, or Phil explain that in a little bit more detail. But every year we also draw down a little bit on our fund balance as illustrated here. And we replenish it. And we replenish our fund balance by taking the unused emergency uh, reserve fund, as well as additional monies left over from line items in our operation budget or in our CIP. So that's the concept. I don't want to go too in depth, but I do believe this will be an immediate tax relief, which will help keep our, keep our taxes, our tax increase at a manageable level for this current emergency that we're in and next year for recovery, which will send a positive message to the folks that are hurting, okay, and will be hurting, and a positive message in order to attract new development, commercial activity, which will then expand our tax base, helping to alleviate that individual tax burden. So that's my soapbox pitch from memory. And I'll let staff, if they want to go through some of this a little bit, this, this spreadsheet in front of us. Well, we can do that, Mayor. I, I think what I'd like to do is, first of all, get a really good understanding of what it is you would like to accomplish and have staff come back to you and the council with our thoughts on that. Um, what you're looking at here, um, and Jill, you're on the line, correct? Uh, she's off the line. She's off the line, okay. So what you're looking at here is the fund balance for FY17, FY18, FY19, and FY20. And you can see the different columns. Uh, you have non-spendable, uh, which is already money that we cannot 
spend because it's been earmarked. You have the education fund balance, which is restricted. The assigned uh, fund balance uh, are items that money has already been reserved for. And then the unassigned is really what we base our fund balance on. That's money that we do not have uh, an earmark for or has been reserved that is available. And that's what our fund balance is based on when the auditors come in and they look at how we're doing with our fund balance. And you can see in FY17, it was 5.89 uh, million. And then F uh, or FY17, and then FY18 is 7.1, FY19 7.7. So it grew from FY18 to FY19 by uh, 670,000 or so, a little less than that. And then FY19, it was 7.7, .7, and it grew from FY19 to FY20 to 8. A little more than eight million. So the increase there was uh, about two hundred twenty thousand. We're at approximately ten percent of uh, the fund balance that we have as a city. Uh, the policy that was adopted by City Council back in two thousand eleven uh, indicated that the fund balance should be uh, twelve percent. Uh, what we're doing right now is probably comparable with what most cities do, uh, around 10% to 12%. Uh, there are some communities where the fund balance will be a higher percentage of that, and there are some that it will be lower. Uh, we're trying to have a financially sound city government. And you go down to the uh, emergency reserve, you can see uh, the amounts there in the emergency reserve and Jill has already talked about the fact that this is tied to a formula the mayor spoke about that so the calculation for FY20 was 445,000 and then the unused emergency reserve that lapsed to the fund balance you can see what the amounts were uh, for FY17, FY18, FY19 and FY20 and then you go down to the bottom of this graph and you'll see uh, the budgeted use of surplus. Uh, right now for FY20, we're using $527,500. Uh, when I became uh, city manager, uh, we were at uh, 825,000, and we dropped that down and we went back up again. That's to minimize the impact on the taxpayers. Uh, right now we're budgeted at a little more than 400,000 for FY21. Our goal is to try and reduce this and to eliminate it at some point in time. That would be the right thing to do, but it's not a simple thing to do. Like a lot of things with budgeting, it's a delicate balance. And then you can see education, where education is, uh, and what they've been utilizing for fund balance. And again, going up to the top where it says restricted education fund balance, that's what education's fund balance is for FY20, 2.2 million, almost 2.3. Uh, hopefully this has been clear. Uh, again, I'd like to have a better understanding of what you're thinking, Mayor, and then have staff come back with um, some of our thoughts for you and the council. Councilor Milks. Yeah, uh, Peter, if you, just uh, that the uh, spreadsheet's off now, but the, just to make sure I understand clearly what the fund balance, when, when you say, so in fiscal year 2020, 527,000 right. was used to offset, in other words, instead of, the, instead of the mill rate being increased to cover the spending, we took money out of the reserves, 527 to cover the spending that would have been charged to the taxpayer, correct? Yes. Oh, okay. We use we use that. It's a, I call it a tax stabilization fund. Uh, it's, it's to stabilize uh, the the impact on the taxpayers. So the other option in that situation would have been to cut spending by five hundred twenty seven five hundred. That would have done the same thing. Theoretically, it would, it would have. Again, as you're learning with this budget, you know there are a lot of fixed costs that we have as a city government. Yeah. Easier said than done, but it would have been. Yes. Yep. 
understood. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other council comments? Councilor Gary? I'll come down the row here. Except the unmute. Sorry. I understand the way the taxes go. Everybody's paid their taxes. The money that we're using to fund this budget is already in hand. I'm worried about next year's budget and the taxes that aren't collected yet. With this virus scare and all these people getting sick and people not working and businesses shut down, if they can't afford to pay their taxes or all of them, how are we going to recoup the money in order to make sure we have the but the money in our budget to do minimum city services? Well, we we've been looking at this issue and time, and you've heard me talk about it. We right now, as a city, about I think it's over ninety percent of the taxes that are paid um, are automatic. People have them paid. Um, so through escrow accounts, um, but we can't predict what's gonna happen with the economy. Your point's a good one. Um, we've looked at what our revenues are that we projected. And when we have the budget workshop on Thursday, we can have more of a discussion on that if people would like. Uh, but we have looked at that. Our estimates we think are realistic uh, in their conservative, but uh, it is concerning. I think the the one thing that, among others, that gives me some encouragement is what we're going through right now is not a, a result of the economy um, caving in. Uh, it's not like the previous recession that we had in 2009 when the bubble exploded on the economy because of what was going on. This is being driven by the pandemic it's having some terrible impacts on people um, in small businesses in particular, uh, and we all know that. Um, but my hope would be that when we get through this pandemic, uh, that the recovery will be quicker uh, because it's not a result of the economy, it's a result of the pandemic. And we are working with the recovery team to help position us to be able to uh, be in the best position possible with your support uh, so that we are ready uh, when that recovery starts to happen. Councilor Milch, you had a follow-up? Yeah, are we in that, guys, are we factoring in people being able to delay or forego a payment? I know of several people that have called their lenders and said, I can't pay my mortgage this month. And so they've allowed them to miss a month. You had mentioned the escrow payments. Yeah. That included in that. And we've already pushed back property taxes for everybody for by a month. Are we anticipating a reduction in revenue? And are we anticipating that for next year? You know, if somebody said two or three months that they're able to push those back, those those mortgage payments. Again, we, we have talked about it. Uh, deal's not on the line. So I, uh, what I'd like to do is, is have further discussion about this on Thursday when Jill will be participating in that workshop and we can talk about it in more detail. Well, let's have a, a revenue conversation then too, because to Steve's point, your escrow account has a padding, has an emergency supply of cash. You always have almost a full year of escrow money in your account um, right. in case of something happens. So we might be all set for the next tax payment due, what, September 15th? Uh, from individual residents, homeowners, it might be the one after that that gets problematic. Um, but I'd like to see what some of those Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, Freddie Mae, Fannie Mac rules are concerning escrow requirements reserves. Councilor McLeod? I just had a question, city manager. Can you take that spreadsheet that we were just shown and extrapolate that out uh, for another two or three years? One showing what the mayor was saying. If we if we were to follow exactly how he just explained it, what the impact would be on FY 21, 22, 23, just to show it, like where the fund balance could hypothetically end up and how this would all work out. Because 
<clears throat> there's a potential that we could be done this in a month that we would pull back the emergency enough that we're not in emergency. There's also a potential that this could go to July, which would bring us into another fiscal year. Right. And in theory, right. the fund balance would double over. So if we could see it both ways, just to right. get a numbers idea of what we're actually looking at and kind of like discussing, it'd be very helpful. We, uh, we can try to do some projections like that. Again, I want to, I want to talk with the mayor and make sure I fully understand what he's talking about. Um, but yes, we can we can give you some scenarios. That'd be um, great, thank you. And I think the other aspect of that too, Tim, is, is, is when we're looking at those variables, we're looking at what potentially has been included in the fund balance um, that is leftover funds from uh, negotiations of capital expenses, not filling of payroll positions and so forth. As well as I think the important point, and Mr. Manager said it, we have to move away from budgeting uh, or using the fund balance because it's, to save the taxpayers money next year, but at the cost of taxpayers this year and last year. It's still tax dollars, but we do have to wean ourselves away. And part of our resolution towards the school committee was sending that message as well. I will say the city only uses, what, not even 5% of their fund amount? That's 5%. Yeah, small, comparatively to the school, which is interesting as you saw that formula, uh, your spreadsheet rather, they'll use almost all of it, and then replenish almost all of it annually. And Councilor Carrier, I don't believe they have a line item for fund balance replenishment, do they? No. So once money goes into the school budget, it can never come back out. I don't want, so in other words, once we allocate and that money is set aside for education, and let's say their line items are high, higher, you know, um, or budgeted higher than actuals, all the, re all the additional revenue goes into their fund balance. It can never move or be used for anything other than education. It's just something to think about. Councilor, or Councilor Lozani and the Councilor Carrier. I appreciate um, this thinking, but I would really love to have it with Jill there. And, and as, as the manager mentioned, have him get some feedback from his staff so that they're part of this conversation. They've got input into it. Because it, it is a big decision, and I think as you mentioned and, and as uh, the manager mentioned, we need to move away from this fund that we sort of dip into and then replenish and dip into. But I think it's going to take more than just the next couple of weeks for us to really understand what this means. Well, I've done budgeting for 20 years and it will be hard. But frankly, I think the plan that we can debate later will get us there, not to the point where we're not using it as much but getting to the point where we're giving an immediate emergency relief in a state of emergency to the residents of Auburn and businesses, which is the ultimate goal. That's the intent. The intent is to lower that mill rate, not leave a structural deficit, okay, but really make sure that we're set up uh, for success and coming out of this as quick as possible. Um, but I'll talk to the manager about that. Mr. Manager, looking at the dates and times that the council wanted to act on this, this um, amendment, uh, or excuse me, an ordinance change um, in time for to be impactful for this budget. We'll have to have that workshop relatively quickly. If not on Thursday, yeah, on Thursday if we could. Because we'll have to have a workshop and then we'll have to introduce it to our agenda starting in May. Well, and the we'll budget doesn't have to be adopted by charter um, before the end of June. So you, you, you've got some time here and I think Obviously, we don't want to do any, we don't want to do damage uh, to to the city in terms of what we're doing. Well, we, we do have we, to, we do have to do it. No, it has to be done before the end of June. We have to do it when we adopt in good faith our CIP and the appropriations budget for the city. Um, we need to know what the effect of the mill rate will be when we do that. So it has to be. I think we we might have looking at the calendar. It's kind of stacked to my wall. We have to address this in May. We will not do more harm. Then good, well, we absolutely can, not. Yeah, um, we can, some we can some opinions might vary on this, but opinions are opinions and policy is policy. So we have to grab everybody's opinions on policy, but the policy determination will be made by the council. So oh, council absolutely, and we can address it in May. But I, the right now the schedule is that the uh, final reading on the budget would be June fifteenth. So we we've got some time. A question for you, Peter, is yes. the. Uh, as part of the information that you're going to gather for us, could we have some kind of idea about the mill rate and the savings to the mill rate uh, on comparative if we had done this? If you look over those last several years, 
maybe not using those and, and what the mill rate would have been as opposed to what it was? If we had not used the tax stabilization fund? Yes. Approach? Okay. Thank so you. It would have been the same as long unless someone cut spending. Okay. Here's, the, here's the crick of it. It's always, you know, we're, tax, we're stabilizing today's taxes at the cost of yesterday's taxes. I will say if we eliminated this emergency reserve or carried over, excuse me, not eliminate, but carried over from this fiscal year to next fiscal year, I did the math, we would save approximately 16 cents on the mill. That's right, right, increase, on the increase. 16 cents would be diminished. And that is after we fund it for the full half percent and to reimburse the 50,000. So but again, I think, uh, you know, let's, let's get into this sooner versus later though. And if we could, I'm sure there'll be some, and I, I know we've had conversations internally already, Peter, about this. We can have some further ones, but um, if this is a topic for the 23rd, we can make it a topic on the 23rd as well, if we need a little bit more time internally. <laughs> Councilor McLeod to Councilor Walker. So this might not be the right venue for this, but <clears throat> the school department, if they're dipping in that far every year, <coughs> either they're over, <coughs> over budgeted or we are underfunding them because they, they should strive to get away from that as well. If they're dipping in millions of dollars every year into their fund balance, we've either allocated way too much every year to get that incrementally up, or we ha are not funding it at the correct level enough so they don't have to dip into it for what they're using and what they're utilizing. It's one, well, or, it's one or the other or a little of both. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. That, that Phil, if you could put that screen back up. It'll show you what the school department has done in terms of their use of fund balance. It's not millions of dollars every year. But if you take a look at these lines here, um, you know, this year is 877,296, FY19, $719,417, $906,822 in FY18, and then $906,822 in FY17. So that's that has been the trend on what they've been utilizing from the fund balance. Councilor Carrier, do you have some insight on this being part of the school well, board? The, I'll tell you that the use, the projected use from the school department was to use a million dollars this year. <clears throat> and, and part of the issue that we're struggling with right now is we've had budgets that are that big, but during the year we, we move money around to, to pay for different projects and it's savings and projects. And I think that there just needs to be a closer look taken at it. I mean, if we can, if you can afford to move three or $400,000 around, uh, to get him back to uh, Tim's thing, then possibly we've overfunded in certain areas. Uh, so we need to take a very close look at that. Uh, and if you can do it year after year after year, then yeah, we really need to take a close look at it. Uh, Councilor Walker. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the same thing. Every year there is a lot of uh, a lot of capital money, I guess we want to call it, that ends up over into the fund balance, so that we can do a lot of extra things that need to be done, or we purchase things that public works may need, or the recreation department may need, or someone else may need out of that so it doesn't become a capital uh you know one capital thing that one of us can say well we would like to cut because we're saying well we're using monies that were left over to purchase what it is that they need now or a little later but i want to go back to the screen there back in 2017 there was probably a million and a half ahead and for two million that was taken from that uh, high number that you can't see. You only see a five, eight, nine, seven there, five million. Because there was a problem back then that somebody was double taxed or whatever. So we owed that somebody a million dollars, a million and five hundred, whatever the number was. And that's that's where that was drawn from. So it's not only five hundred thousand dollars that may be taken out of that un that unassigned. We could be in that same problem tomorrow. Someone makes a big mistake with some company 
and we owe them a million bucks. There goes a million bucks because that's the only place we've got a million dollars to pay somebody back from. Or if it was three million, we'd have to take it out of the eight million. We'd be down to five now. And the next five years, we're trying to build this back up again. And if you look at the book where we have our auditor come in, if I remember right, they said we looked really good where we were this year, that it, it's, you know, it's nice to be at the 10 million, but the 8 million, I think to them looks pretty good. So I don't know if, uh, if what your suggestion with the 445,000 uh, would hurt going forward one bit, I think it would help because the taxpayers need the relief. And number two, I said from the beginning, our budget is uh, somewhere around $70,000, still too high. And our bond in is at whatever, $9 million. That's still a $1 million too high as well. So that's where I stand with all of that. Just a comment, Councillor Walker, uh, on what you were talking about regarding the, I think you were talking about the assessing error. Yep. Um, we we uh, put a spending freeze on after that happened, and we actually were able to finish the year pretty much break even. So we did not have to dip into the fund balance, but we were fortunate that we didn't have to do that. Um, so either way, it's still either way, it's a game played that we froze everybody. We didn't spend any money, but the taxpayers still paid the bill. We just didn't spend the money. In that direction, we spent it in another direction. It cost us over a million five hundred thousand to get out of that bunch of baloney that we got into because someone didn't pay attention. That worked for the city of Auburn. Well, without getting into all the all the all of that issue, I think in terms of the unallocated funding, uh, we could give you a history on that. Actually, when I did my five-year CIP presentation. There was a report that had a breakdown of that in the letter that that uh, you were sent. I can send that back to you again because um, I appreciate your point. There are certain areas that uh, we have not spent the money that we thought we would like, for example, demolition of buildings, acquisition of buildings, that kind of thing. And that's in the, the fund balance portion that's actually not available, but that's reserved. Right. It's good to know a separate, a separate fund. I will That's say from correct. a structural standpoint of setting up separate um, accounts for fund balances is smart. It makes perfect sense. And nowhere in this um, ordinance proposal or language proposal I sent out does it talk about rating or taking any money out of that. Um, and I think to Councillor Walker's point, any additional cuts that we can find, we use that to minimize the need to go into the fund balance for, as you call it, tax stabilization, which will further <laughs> minimize the amount coming out of that fund balance. It's an accelerated process of getting out of that habit. Um, Got to start somewhere. Uh, so let's, if we can, let's just see if we can put it on the agenda for the 23rd. I think the 23rd is becoming more of a concrete date, folks. Yeah, yeah, Thursday the 23rd. Mr. So Mayor, you mentioned sending out language. I don't think Peter and I, or maybe Peter received it, but I have not seen that. Um, I sent it out to you this morning, Phil. Okay. It was under subsection C of the paragraph. Yeah, I need to I need to review it more closely. Yeah, but, mind you, it was seven o'clock in the morning and it was like one yeah. coffee deep. So yeah. you know, no yeah. there's no honor in ling linguistical skills on that one. But the point's the point. Okay. Is there any other comments on this or anything else about the budget? It's eight thirty seven right now. We've been going at it for a good three hours plus. Is there anything, any other comments anybody wants to make? One follow-up comment to that, Jason, maybe, uh, Mr. Mayor, you could maybe, with giving some positive feedback on that concept, maybe we could put that in a little more of a, a Word document or some sort, what that would look like, a little more, um, you know, cultivated to get a better look at that ordinance, because I, I think it's a, a really good concept. We'll have to talk about the cultivated thing. I'm not sure if I should take offense or take, uh, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean. No, I'm working on it. Yeah, it's 837, but I think I will. I'll get it. Yeah, no, I understand. It's a concept. Again, the first two sections of that ordinance were just copy-pasted straight out of, out of the ordinance. Um, 
So that was, you know, I just added that section C in italics. But uh, let's see if we can tweak it out. I agree with the manager. He's got a lot more experience in this than I do. I just get thoughts out um, and then let you all debate it and discuss it and move forward on it. But again, the ultimate goal, I think we all agree, what I'm gleaning from everybody here is good fiscal policy, tightening our belts to provide some tax relief or lessen the impact on tax increase, setting ourselves up with an allocation of resources that will have, if possible, alignment with strategic plan, prioritized on increasing tax base, economic development, commercial viability. That's the ultimate mission statement? Okay, awesome. There we go. It's as easy as that. Does anybody have anything else to add before we call it a night? Okay. Call it a night. Thank you all. Good night, folks. Thank you. Thanks for listening.